This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 309 of the program. Today is Friday, October 8th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make this show possible. All of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week, or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Alexander Walden, Karen Webster, Rick and Steve, and Teresa Jimenez. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the podcast, I would very much appreciate that. You can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support to join us via PayPal. You can support us at Patreon if you go over to patreon.com slash humanistreport or underneath any one of our YouTube videos, you can click join and easily support us that way. So uh, this week, we kind of randomly have a gigantic episode, and uh, I'm, I'm pretty stoked for it. Here's what's coming up. Kirsten Cinema was confronted by protesters in a bathroom. We'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about how she was confronted on an airplane and at an airport, which led to the far right rushing to her defense. I wonder why they're sticking up for her. Hmm. But she wasn't the only one to feel the heat because Joe Manchin was confronted by protesters while he was on his luxury yacht. Also on this episode, a Facebook whistleblower exposes how the company deliberately uses its algorithm to promote hate for purposes of profit. And we'll also talk about why Senator John Hickenlooper seemed very concerned about that. The Pandora Papers exposes how elites hide their wealth. Dave Rubin's grift begins to unravel, but fret not, because a new grift from Russell Brand has emerged out of the ashes of Dave Rubin's old grift. Anti-vaxxers protest New York City's vaccine mandate by destroying a COVID testing tent. Okay, makes sense. New studies reveal that the COVID-19 vaccines not only reduce transmission, but have already saved hundreds of thousands of lives. Caitlyn Jenner reveals that Republicans were embarrassed to be seen with her in public. I mean, this story is just shocking to me, frankly. The Alabama governor uses COVID relief funds to build prisons. And finally, we end the show by talking to 2022 congressional candidate Isaiah James. And also, I will talk to Sam from Reset Race about reparations. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. It's a lot. But let's get right to it. If you don't want to watch the stories as, as they come up, you can uh, use the bar to fast forward here and choose topics if you're watching this on YouTube. So yeah, folks, let's dive right in. So last week, the Democratic Party was trying to hash out details of the reconciliation proposal named the Build Back Better Act, and Kirsten Sinema stated that she was opposed to it. So rather than trying to state why she's opposed to it or pick at any particular provision within that package that she doesn't like, she chose to just abandon negotiations altogether, and she left D.C. Now, her spokesperson claimed that she had a good reason. Right. She had a doctor's appointment. Turns out that was actually a lie because she was doing something else. So as Brian Tyler Cohen explains, Kirsten Sinema has left D.C. amid negotiations. Her spokesman says it's for a doctor's appointment for a foot injury. But a hotel just confirmed she will be at her PAX retreat with donors for cocktails and dinner at a high end resort and spa in Phoenix. Yeah. So that's why she wasn't in D.C. She is obstructing her entire party's agenda, refusing to even engage in negotiation. She's not even saying what specifically she doesn't like about the Build Back Better Act. She's just choosing to not participate altogether, holding up everything for everyone. And she lied about why she couldn't be there. She was with her donors. So it seems like the only way you can actually get access to Kirsten Cinema is if you're one of her multi-million dollar donors, which is why confrontations like this become a necessity because if a politician is refusing to even meet with members of Congress, then of course they're not going to engage with their constituents. But when she was at ASU, her constituents found her and they decided to confront her. And this was incredible to watch. Enjoy. Okay, I'll be back. Sit down, we want to talk to you real quick. Can we talk to you real quick? Hi, actually, I am heading out. The, um, right now is a real moment that our people need in order for us to be able to talk about what's really happening. We need a Build Back Better plan right now. We, we're not that door. We need solutions to the 
build that better plan, we have the solutions that we need. We knocked on doors for you to get you elected. And just how we got you elected, we can get you out of office if you don't support what you promised us. We need seven million citizenship for seven million. We need the build that better plan right now. <laughs> My name is Blanca. I was brought here to the United States when I was three years old. And in 2010, my grandparents both got deported because of SB 1070. And I'm here because I definitely believe that we need a pathway to citizenship. My grandfather passed away two weeks ago, and I was not able to go to Mexico and visit him because there is no pathway to citizenship. And if we have the opportunity to pass it right now, then we need to do it because there's millions of undocumented people just like me who share the same story or even worse things that happen to them because of SB 1070 and because of anti-immigrant legislation. And this is the opportunity to pass it right now and we need you to hold, we need to hold you accountable to what you told us, what you promised us that you were going to pass when we knocked on doors for you. It's not right. I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor of human trafficking and it's because of the lack of worker protections that we don't have in the gig economy. I need you to stand by workers, lots of people who are like me, that was absolutely amazing because you know that she was seething, but she was trying to hold it together. You know she was uncomfortable. And look, here's what I would argue. Anytime Kirsten Cinema shows her face in public, she should be worried that more protesters, more constituents are going to confront and heckle her because people's lives are on the line. Those folks who were heckling her, they were actually very polite. They had real issues and they actually helped get her elected. One of them was a dreamer who was brought here when she was three years old, couldn't even leave the country to see her grandfather who was dying because our immigration system is completely broken. You had somebody who was a gig worker at the end there. And to her, this is all a game. She's lying about why she can't negotiate and get this done because she's meeting with her donors. It's despicable. This is all a game to her. So since she's not taking this seriously, you have to find her, confront her, and force her to take this seriously. Force her to explain why she's against this. And she's not going to answer you, but hell, she needs to be ashamed to show her face in public. And until she buckles, until she does what her constituents want her to do, until she does what she promised she would do when she ran for Congress, you absolutely do things like this. I think it's absolutely necessary, and I love it. But she was mad. She was not happy about that. And she released this statement, which says, Yesterday, several individuals disrupted my class at Arizona State University. After deceptively entering a locked, secure building, these individuals individuals filmed and publicly posted videos of my students without their permission, including footage taken of both my students and I using a restroom. In Arizona, we love the First Amendment. Oh, I'm sure you do. We know it is vital to our democracy that constituents can freely petition, protest, or criticize my policy positions and decisions. The activist group that engaged in yesterday's behavior is one that both my team and I have met with several times since I was elected to the Senate, and I will continue engaging with Arizonans with diverse viewpoints to help inform my work for Arizona. Yesterday's behavior was not legitimate protest. It is unacceptable for activist organizations to instruct their members to jeopardize themselves by engaging in unlawful activities such as gaining entry to closed university buildings, disrupting learning environments, and filming students in a restroom. In the 19 years I have been teaching at ASU, I have been committed to creating a safe and intellectually challenging environment for my students. Yesterday, that environment was breached. My students were unfairly and unlawfully victimized. Victimized. Oh my God, this is wholly inappropriate. It is the duty of elected leaders to avoid fostering an environment in which honesty held policy disagreements serve as the basis for vitriol, raising the temperature in public rhetoric and creating a permission structure for unacceptable behavior. So really, she's just angry that her students were victimized. First of all, why are you teaching at ASU? They should fire you. You have nothing to offer. You're a corrupt politician. You are a case study in how money in politics destroys democracy, but you shouldn't be the one teaching that class. It should be someone else who's using you as the basis for informing others. I mean, nobody cares. This is all just bullshit. She doesn't like that she was heckled. It seems as if those protesters struck a nerve, which is all the more reason to do it again. Keep protesting her. If you see her at a restaurant, confront her. Protest politely, of course. You're not going to endanger her or assault her or anything. But I think that politicians, if they do things like what she's doing, 
brazenly disregarding what her constituents and all of America wants, the Build Back Better Act is incredibly popular. If she's going to do things like this, then I think this is the only way you really get their attention. And it worked. I mean, that's proof that it worked because she had to release a statement. Now, in terms of what the president thinks about this, his response was honestly amazing because he was not outraged and she's obstructing his agenda. So he should be mad. And it turns out he didn't care that she was protested and protesters followed her into a bathroom. This was awesome to see. President, uh, you're talking about how you have 48 Democratic votes right now. The other two uh, have been pressured over the weekend by activists. Joe Manchin had people on kayaks show up to his boat, T.L. Adam. Senator Sinema last night was chased into a restroom. Do you think that those tactics are crossing a line? I don't think they're appropriate tactics, but it happens to everybody. From The, <laughs> the only people it doesn't happen to are people who have Secret Service standing around them. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's part of the process. Yes, sir. Really quickly, a lot of people have been- it happens to everybody. It's part of the process. Precisely. It's happened to Joe Biden. And as people in America continue to get desperate, these sorts of protest tactics are going to become more and more common. But if you don't like your constituents who helped you get elected following you into bathrooms, one thing that you can do is you can stop fucking them over, perhaps. That's that's one thing. But she's not. She's going to continue to get heckled in public. She's going to cry victim. And she's going to claim that other members of her party, i.e. leftist lawmakers, are the ones who's encouraging it. When in actuality, this is her own actions. Had she not left D.C. and actually tried to engage in good faith and negotiations with her party, perhaps this wouldn't have even been necessary. But she chose to leave to go to a retreat with her donors. So I'm sorry. Uh, cry me a river, cope, get fucked, Senator. And she's not the only one, right? Because Joe Manchin, there were protesters that showed up to his yacht, and we'll talk about that in a different video, and they confronted him for obstructing this agenda as well. So this is great. I hope that we see it again. Unless she actually stops being a corrupt corporate shill, then this should continue to happen so long as she's a member of the U.S. Senate. You serve the people, but you're only serving your donors, so they're going to get more desperate, and things like this will become increasingly necessary if you continue to do what you're doing, and that is uh, screwing them over at the behest of your corporate donors. So I've talked about why I absolutely love the protests that we're seeing of Senator Kirsten Sinema. I love the protest of ASU students following her into a bathroom, confronting her about her refusal to support or even negotiate with other Democrats about the Build Back Better Act. I think that that is all necessary because if you refuse to hold a town hall, if you refuse to meet with your constituents, they have no other means of actually communicating with you. So they have to do things like this. I mean, they can leave you voice messages, but you're not going to return their calls. You're not even going to listen to them. Staffers will listen to them. So this is the only mechanism that they have. It's the only tactic that they have that's effective. And we know that this is an effective tactic because it actually led to you putting out a statement to talk about how much you hated this tactic. She uh, released a statement claiming that this is not a legitimate form of protest, But I mean, protest is supposed to make you feel uncomfortable. So if you don't want them to follow you around on airplanes and at airports and in bathrooms, meet with them and stop refusing to negotiate with your Democratic Party colleagues in order to head to private donor retreats. Just do better and maybe this will stop. But, you know, most people actually seem to be against Kirsten Cinema, and they're in support of these protesters. One of the protesters was a dreamer. But do you want to know who is siding with Kirsten Cinema here? The far right. And they are rushing to her defense. Hmm, I wonder why that's the case. One of them is white nationalist Stephen Miller, who used to work with Donald Trump's administration. He tweeted out support saying, as you can see below, illegal aliens are unlawfully harassing a U.S. senator to demand passage of Biden's budget reconciliation bill because it will give them amnesty. A confident country would not allow lawbreakers to criminally harass lawmakers to reward their lawbreaking. Shameful. Shameful, but this is exactly who Stephen Miller is, and this is one of the allies that Kirsten Sinema is making. Someone who is uh, against immigration, period. If he had his way, he would close off all borders indefinitely. He doesn't want anyone here 
who doesn't look like him, who doesn't have the same complexion as he does. And now he's defending Kirsten Cinema because she is an obstacle to passing immigration reform and any priority that would benefit normal Americans, including that dreamer who is an American. And Mike Lee also came to her defense, saying, Senator Cinema is a friend. I am appalled by this behavior. There is no place in civilized society for the type of harassment she suffered. First of all, uh, she was not harassed. They were incredibly polite. And there's no place in civilized society for this much suffering, which is being caused by individuals like Kirsten Cinema, who's refusing to act. I mean, this is all the result of her own actions or inaction, I should say. Had she actually took the time to meet with her constituents and hear their concerns, they wouldn't have to follow her into bathrooms. This is a public servant. She serves them. One of the people who confronted her helped get her elected. They canvassed for her. And you're going to say that this is uh, terrible and th th this b behavior is so appalling. You know, but save your pearl clutching. If you're going to clutch your pearls, clutch it at the suffering that we're seeing in this late stage capitalist hellscape that far right wingers like you helped build. But that wasn't all because uh, Turning Point USA's Charlie Kirk also chimed in and he somehow had a worse, more disgustingly egregious racist response than white nationalist Stephen Miller. I, I wish I were kidding about this. He told you that the Democrats are going to eat their own that they are going to go into a widespread Democrat civil war very, very soon. So now here you have a Democrat senator from Arizona on a college campus, which is like a home turf, that is being followed into the restroom by illegal aliens. These are illegal aliens. These are, these are trespassers in our country. They should be deported immediately with all of their friends, which won't happen. And the question is, how many Joe Biden have realized, how many Joe Biden voters have now realized that Build Back Better is actually just a Marxist incantation? I know so many people that voted for Joe Biden that are now regretting it for good reason. Senator Cinema has responded to the left wing protesters who recorded her inside of the Arizona bathroom calling it a lawless demonstration, which it was. And they should all be arrested. But they won't be, because if they get arrested, well, they might get arrested, but they definitely won't be deported. What would happen if a Republican chased a Democrat senator into the restroom? Insurrectionist, domestic terrorist, we would know their name, and they would be arrested. If a Republican did what the illegal alien Democrat activists did at Arizona State University, they would be indefinitely incarcerated in solitary confinement. That was absolutely deeply offensive, but totally on brand for a racist piece of shit like Charlie Kirk. He says illegal aliens, uh, these trespassers uh, in our country, they should be deported immediately with all of their friends. They should be arrested. You know, if I had my way, I would take a hundred dreamers like that girl who confronted Kirsten Cinema in exchange for you. If we could send you to some other country, just anywhere, I, I would prefer that. I'd prefer that dreamer over you. She's the real American. You're not the real American. You're the traitor to America. Fuck you, Charlie Kirk. You're a piece of shit. And notice how embedded in everything that he says, it's always this persecution complex, this right-wing victim complex. He said that if a right-winger did that to Kirsten Cinema, they would be indefinitely incarcerated in solitary, solitary confinement. No, they wouldn't. No, they wouldn't. They've done this before. Uh, in fact, just a couple of years ago, Alex Jones harassed Bernie Sanders in an airport, and he didn't have a legitimate reason to harass Bernie Sanders. He was just following him around just spouting off random nonsense about how he has three mansions and how socialism is bad and it's destroying the country. Was Alex Jones arrested? No, it happens all the time. But Charlie Kirk really wants to believe that right-wingers are always the victims. But in actuality, it's the people who he called an illegal alien, the human being who he called an alien. That's the victim here. They're victimized by right-wing senators like Kirsten Sinema who refuse to act. Now, this became such a huge thing for right-wingers that 
one actually questioned the White House press secretary about Joe Biden's comments because he was pretty unsympathetic and his response, I think, was perfect. He said, yeah, it happens. This is part of the process. And um, Ducey's son, I I'm blanking on his name. Is it Steve or Doug? It's one of the Ducey's, the fail son, the imbecile. He questioned Jen Psaki about this and, and look at the feigned outrage. It's so insufferable. Uh, a group of activists followed Senator Kirsten Sinema into a ladies' room screaming about the Build Back Better plan yesterday. The president said today, I don't think they're appropriate tactics, but... It happens to everybody, and it's part of the process. He is an expert on the process. Has he ever been chased into a restroom by well, activists? Let, let me be clear here, because I think the context of what happened here is very important. Um, and Senator Sinema put out a statement this morning. So as she said, and I would reiterate from here, the protection of the freedom to protest, to speak out, and to criticize is fundamental to our democracy. The president believes that. Maybe he shorthanded it, but he wanted to make that clear this morning. What happened this week? Weekend was that her classroom, her students, uh, and, and the safe and intellectually stimulating environment she's worked to create during the years she's t of teaching at, at ASU were, was breached. That's inappropriate and unacceptable. And I think the context of what happened here is important, despite the fact that, of course, we stand for, the president stands for, the fundamental right of people to protest, to object, to criticize, uh, as they often do outside of the gates of the White House. So does the White House condemn these protesters who chased her into the room? I just said it was in appropriate and unacceptable. I think that pretty much not to do that again. I think that's pretty clear that they shouldn't uh, they shouldn't uh, uh, breach the the classroom and make the students feel like their privacy, their intellectually stimulating classroom uh, and their time as students in college is being uh, broken. OK, I can't take any more. That was a weak response from Jen Psaki. Don't back down. Never back down. Only double down when it comes to right wingers. See, they're pretending as if it's Kirsten Sinema who's the victim. That's the narrative that the right-wing media sphere and right-wingers in general are trying to put out there, right? They're trying to make it seem as if Kirsten Sinema, she was victimized. She was followed into a, into a bathroom. This is so terrible. Except that's not the case. She wasn't victimized. She's the victimizer. She's victimizing people like her constituent, constituents who were forced to confront her because they had no other means of communicating with their senator who represents them, nobody else. You know, these right-wingers, they'll call that dreamer an illegal alien, which no human being is an alien, but they'll say, you know, she should be deported. And anything she says is invalid because she's not a citizen. But yet, she pays taxes, probably. I'm assuming she's a worker. She's been here since, since she was three years old. She pays taxes. She's more of an American than most billionaires are in the United States who dodge taxes. But yet they get representation. The corporate donors who give thousands of dollars to Kirsten Cinema, she hears them out. Hmm. I wonder why that is. So, I mean, long story short, Kirsten Cinema has made a bunch of new friends with the far right. So she needs to be uh, primaried and excommunicated from the Democratic Party. And anything that they can do to punish her in Congress, they should do that. Meanwhile, her constituents need to continue to keep the pressure on her and confront her and heckle her every single day, everywhere she goes. So in response to Kirsten Cinema getting confronted at ASU with protesters following her into the bathroom, I, of course, endorsed that protest. It is a legitimate form of protest because she's left her constituents no other means of engaging with her. Um, and, and I also stated in the video that I did talking about that, that I really hope that it happens more. Everywhere Kirsten Cinema goes, she should be heckled, she should be confronted, and guess what? That's happening. So on a plane, one of her constituents decided to ask her whether or not she would commit to passing reconciliation, and as you're going to see, she said nothing. I just want to know if um, you can commit, as, as my senator, as you, if you can commit to passing a reconciliation that could provide a pathway to citizenship for immigrants. We have been waiting for this for too long. I just need to know if you can commit to passing a budget reconciliation that would include immigration and citizenship 
for people to be protected, like me and many others. Can you commit to that, Senator? I'm just asking you a simple question. I'm being vulnerable right now to you. My dad passed away. My dad passed away. My dad passed away last year, and he didn't get to reunite with my family. I don't want to disturb you, but at the same time, I just want to see if you, I can get a commitment from you, Senator. This is my life and the life of millions in the line. I just need to hear from you. Can we get a commitment from you to get a path with citizenship through the Bosnian reconciliation to protect me and millions like me? Can I get a commitment from you? No answer. Refusing to engage at all. Just blank face, completely unmoved by the protester, trying to get her to answer a simple question. And she doesn't even have to commit right then and there. She can say, listen, I understand your concerns. I'm working on something. Uh, we'll try to we'll try to get it done. She doesn't say anything. She doesn't even attempt to placate her constituents as Joe Manchin even does. She just ignores them. But that wasn't all, because off the plane, she was also confronted by protesters, and they asked her again, will you commit to support and reconciliation? If not, what do you want to cut from the bill? Take a look. Hi, Senator Kinnaman. I want to ask if you can explain to the American people Hi. what you're planning on cutting from Joe Biden's Build Back Better plan. Sorry, I'm having trouble Do you want right to cut now. climate priorities? Is it elder care hearing. that you want to cut, or is it child care? that is awesome to see and that really is the perfect question what do you want to cut she's not saying what she doesn't like about the 3.5 trillion dollar build back better plan she's just saying that she won't support it so do you want to take out climate priorities do you want to take out child care what do you want to take out from it? But she refuses to answer. And you can tell that she's irritated. She's she's not really showing it, but you can tell she is seething. But it didn't end there. Protesters followed her up the escalator as well and out the door of the airport. Watch. Senator Sinema, who would you cut out from Build Back Better? Who would you leave behind? Senator Sinema, who would you leave behind? Senator Sinema, who would you leave behind? Senator, who would you leave behind? The seniors? The immigrants? People without dental care? Who would you leave behind, Senator Sinema? We just want to have a conversation and you're just ignoring everybody. Is this what you think leadership is? Senator Manchin talks to people. Senator Sinema, all we want to do is have a conversation about who you would leave behind. Who would you leave behind? 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 Oh, I love this so much. I love this so much. These activists truly should be commended. This is how you put pressure on senators. What do you want to leave out, Senator Sinema? Do you want to leave behind uh, seniors, immigrants? Who do you want to leave behind? You're ignoring us. Uh, that person even pointed out that even Joe Manchin engages with constituents and everything that he says is disingenuous and he lies to them, but at least he engages at a minimum. That's the bare minimum 
that we should expect from public representatives, but she just, she doesn't care at all. Now, there was a woman holding up a sign uh, as she was going up the escalator, and if you're wondering what that said, it reads, Hot Bisexual Against Kirsten Cinema," And I love that so much. I love that so much. Anything that they can do to embarrass her, heckle her, put pressure on her over, I'm all for it. Because guess what? This is what is necessary when she refuses to engage. And as People for Bernie points out, she hasn't held a town hall in three years. So what does she expect if she's not talking to her constituents, refusing to even negotiate with her colleagues in the Democratic Party because she is leaving D.C. to go meet with her donors for a private retreat? How, how does she expect them to reach her they have to have some way to communicate with her there has to be some line of communication and since she's refusing to talk to them this is what they're doing they're desperate this is what they have to resort to this isn't just some sort of a game contrary to popular belief this is people's lives this is the future of the planet this is the lives of so many immigrants in this country so many people who just want a chance and she's just She's she's callous. She's cold. She doesn't care. So guess what? If you don't like this Kirsten Cinema, tough because I suspect that this is going to be her life from now on until she agrees to support the bill. Because if you hold so many people's lives in your hand, that is a tremendous amount of responsibility, and and you should be expecting this. And the fact that you have refused to communicate with anyone, this is just going to keep happening. And I'm here for it. I love it. Keep it up, activists. Don't don't back down. Just just keep giving her hell wherever she is. Heckle her. Make her life a living hell if she doesn't actually buckle because there's got to be a breaking point at some point, right? She's got to get tired of this at some point. So keep it up. This is phenomenal. So I've talked a lot about the protesters at ASU that followed Senator Kirsten Sinema into a bathroom. But before we got that epic protest, we got the protest at Joe Manchin's yacht. So there were climate activist protesters who kayaked to his yacht and they confronted him about his refusal to support the Build Back Better Act. And I think that this is perfect. This is exactly what activists should be doing. And you're going to see that he actually did choose to engage with them, unlike Kirsten Cinema, but he also tries to placate them and lie, and they call him on that immediately. Take a look. Let me talk if you can. Where are you all from? Anybody from West Virginia? We have yes. any West Virginians? We have a lot of West Virginians. God bless you all. But gang, we're working hard. We really are. We're going to continue to in good faith. I really. We want to get a good build. It's a balanced bill. It's well done. And I know it won't be enough for some, and it'll be too much for others. In West Virginia, you know, West Virginia is a little bit different than it used to be. There's a lot of poverty. What are you going to do for the we'll poor working, in West Virginia? We're, working, we're going to be working everything we can to create good opportunities. And we need to tax the rich. Well, I agree with that. I definitely agree. That's the one number of thing we should be doing is fixing the tax code so everybody pays their fair share. We should be also negotiating for lower drug prices. We should be doing all these things. Accountable. I agree with you 1,000%. We're on the same page, gang. We really are. Well, we have, here, let me just explain on that one. We will get to that eventually, but right now we can't even take care of it. It's going to go broke in 2026. Let us fix and repair that first. No, that's not true. Tax the rich. We're taxing the rich. I agree. We're going to make the rich and the famous pay. likely to take over the Senate. Because we don't, this is like, this is our one chance right now to pass, 
the, you the legislature. Pill- if we don't do it, do it right, do you think they want you pillaged so they take over? If, if you don't pass this, we're going to yeah, lose they're, this. They're not going to pass yeah. things like this for the people. They're, they're not. Let this is our this. chance. We've, we've, we've- I love this so much because these senators, they're also oligarchs. These are very, very wealthy people. These are multimillionaires who chum it up with elites. So they think that when they go to their yachts, there's not going to be any peasants around. It's it's a peasant-free area, but they actually invaded his safe space. They went into his bubble. And that's really, really effective because that makes them uncomfortable, which is the point of protest. You go there and you make these elites feel uncomfortable. And it's not like he's just some detached billionaire or millionaire. This is a U.S. senator. He's in a position of power and influence. And what he does or doesn't do directly impacts the lives of millions of Americans, hundreds of millions of people. So I don't care where they are, a yacht, the bathroom, protest them wherever they are because they hold all the cards right now. If they choose to not support the Build Back Better Act, how many people will go hungry, become even poorer? How many people will die if they don't get that Medicaid expansion? It's not what we wanted. I wanted Medicare for all, but it's better than nothing. It's a marginal thing to make a slight difference in people's lives. And if they can't even support that, they deserve to feel uncomfortable. They deserve to be heckled every single where uh, a place that they go. Now, the good thing about Joe Manchin is I mean, he at least talks with them. Kirsten Cinema, she was followed through an airport and she just didn't even say a single word to them. She keeps saying, oh, well, I don't negotiate in public. Okay, well, your job is to serve the public. So I think that you owe it to them to explain your position. But one thing about Joe Manchin is even if he is engaging, it's not a good faith conversation. He says it is, but it's not an actuality. He's trying to placate them. He's trying to tell them, what they want to hear, because unlike Kirsten Cinema, I actually do think that he wants to remain in D.C. for a while. Kirsten Cinema, she might literally want to be a one-term senator so she can then go cash in and become a lobbyist. I think that's highly likely. So he wants to at least keep up the appearance that he cares, but we all know that he doesn't. Now, he said a lie, and they called him out on that like this, and I love that. He said that Medicare would go broke in 2026. And they said that's not true. They called him out immediately. We keep hearing this lie about Medicare, about Social Security, that it's becoming insolvent and we have to make changes to it in order to save the program. That is bullshit. And whenever you see or hear a politician rather talk about how Social Security or one of our social safety net programs is going insolvent, call them on that lie. Because what they're basically saying is, I really want to open the door to changes i.e. privatization. That's basically what he's saying there. And we don't need more privatization. We need less privatization. Uh, Now, one person there, that last person said that Republicans are likely to take over the Senate. This is our one chance. This is our last chance. And that, to me, I think that is something that can potentially persuade Joe Manchin. I think he thinks about that. And this is a really great point that Hassan Piker made. He said that Joe Manchin loves the attention. He loves being the swing vote. He loves being in power. So I actually don't think that he wants Democrats to lose power. He wants them to keep a really thin majority in the Senate so he can kind of be the power broker. You know, he, he's the one who can green light deals. He can kill them or save them unilaterally. Uh, but one person there made a great point that we spend $6 trillion over 10 years on the Pentagon budget. And he made some points about, oh, well, that's uh, half of our discretionary budget. You want to know how much of our, our budget is not discretionary? The other half. I don't care what you're saying. The point that she's making is that we spend a lot of money on the military. That is our discretionary budget. Most of the time, most years, It's more than half of our discretionary budget, meaning the money that Congress can control what they do with it. Why are we spending more money on killing people as opposed to spending more money on helping people? It it just it's ridiculous. And nothing that they that they say really, I don't know that it's going to resonate with him. He doesn't at least listen to them, but I think it's going to fall on deaf ears. It really depends on what is in his best interest. If he thinks that this will help him maintain his position of power, he'll support it. But if not, I don't know. I mean, think about where this man makes his money. He's essentially a modern-day 
oil baron. As Mark Hertzgord of The Nation explains, it turns out that the senator wielding this awesome power, America's climate decider-in-chief, one might call him, has a massive climate conflict of interest. Joe Manchin, investigative journalism has revealed, is a modern-day coal baron. Financial records detailed by reporter Alex Koch for the Center for Media and Democracy and published in The Guardian show that Manchin makes roughly half a million dollars a year in dividends from millions of dollars of coal company stock he owns. The stock he held in Enter Systems, Inc., a company Manchin started in 1988 and later gave to his son Joseph to run. So he knows that all of the investments that the Build Back Better Act makes in clean, green, renewable technology, that's going to hurt his bottom line, and he's a greedy oligarch, so the money that he's making, it's not enough. He wants more, but maybe he'll sacrifice it if, for whatever reason, he thinks this is going to be beneficial to his long-term political career. It's the same reason why he didn't support an increase of the minimum wage, because he, I believe, he has stock or he's a shareholder in one of the West Virginian La Quinta inns, so if it were the case that those workers got a $15 an hour minimum wage, that would hurt his own bottom line. So this really is about him and nobody else. Although, side note, there was a weird sub-story that emerged out of this yacht confrontation, and journalist Matthew Chapman, who's basically just a Democratic Party loyalist, he wrote this, which I think he believed was important, but it isn't. He says, people need to stop calling this a yacht. It's a houseboat. It is worth $220,000, which is pretty much exactly the median home price in the United States and considerably less than what most senators spend on their second D.C. residence. My house costs more than this one. Okay, I mean, it looks like a yacht to me, but I'm no expert. The point is that what he's on is very clearly a luxury item that most Americans can't defer, uh, afford. It's called almost heaven. It's supposed to be a luxury thing. So regardless if it's a houseboat or a gigantic raft, it doesn't matter. The point is that it's a luxury item that he was at away from the rest of the peasants. He thought he was insulated and they broke his bubble. They invaded his safe space. So I don't get what Matthew's point was, but good job being a hack. I don't know if you want some sort of award for it, but um, shut the fuck up. Stop protecting the powerful people like Matthew Chapman and Axios who keep writing these fluff pieces for Kirsten Cinema. It's just so bizarre, but that's kind of like a different point. Point is, people have to keep doing this. They have to keep exerting pressure on U.S. lawmakers. I don't care where it is. Bathrooms, yachts, again, it doesn't matter to me. I'll reiterate that point because it's important. It doesn't matter where it happens. If they're at a restaurant, heckle them. If people like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are going to obstruct an agenda that would improve the lives of millions of Americans, they deserve the pressure that they're facing right now. And there's really nothing left to say about this. It's deserved. It's, it's warranted. And most importantly, this is necessary. This needs to happen. Otherwise, they're not going to listen. I'm not sure how many of you noticed, but on Monday, Facebook and its family of apps were down for hours, causing Mark Zuckerberg to lose $6 billion and also leading to the company's stocks tanking. Now, for some additional details, we go to the New York Times, who explains Facebook's apps, which include Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, and Oculus, began displaying error messages around 11.40 a.m. Eastern Time, users reported. Within minutes, Facebook had disappeared from the internet. The outage lasted over five hours before some apps slowly flickered back to life, though the company cautioned the services would take time to stabilize. Technology outages are not uncommon, but to have so many apps go dark from the world's largest social media company at the same time was highly unusual. Facebook's last significant outage was in 2019, when a technical error affected its sites for 24 hours in a reminder that a snafu can cripple even the most powerful internet companies. But it is now over, and when it came back, Facebook's CTO, Mike Schroffer, blamed the outage on, quote, networking issues, but I mean, if I'm being 100% transparent here, I really wish that Facebook never came back. If we could delete Facebook from existence, the world would literally be a better place, I think. And not just delete it from existence, but we need one of those flash pens from Men in Black so we can make all of humanity forget that it ever existed. That's how damaging to the world Facebook is. Not only is it a cesspool of misinformation, but on top of that, Facebook is profiting off of hate. 
And that's not just hyperbole, that's not speculation, that's confirmed by a whistleblower who explained in a 60 Minutes interview how the platform's algorithm literally prioritizes hateful content above all else because that's what keeps people engaged and it keeps them on the platform. Now, that revelation isn't necessarily surprising. In fact, it's pretty obvious, but it runs counter to what the CEO of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, said. Everything that the whistleblower is alleging here Mark Zuckerberg cl claimed that that's not actually the case. So take a look at this video of Mark Zuckerberg juxtaposed with the whistleblower's interview on 60 Minutes, uh, courtesy of The Recount, and it shows you that this man was lying to everyone about his platform and the way that it operates. Do you believe your product can be addictive? We certainly do not design the product uh, in that way. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. The research that we've seen is that using social apps to connect with other people can have positive mental health benefits and well-being benefits. Facebook's own research says as these young women begin to consume this eating disorder content, they get more and more depressed, and it actually makes them use the app more. The way we design our algorithms is to encourage meaningful social interactions. Its own research is showing that content that is hateful, that is divisive, that is polarizing, gets engagement, a reaction. But election interference remains an ongoing threat, so we continue to improve as part of our ongoing commitment to supporting the civic process. They basically said, oh good, we, we made it through the election, there wasn't riots, we can get rid of civic integrity now. We strengthened our enforcement against militias and conspiracy networks like QAnon to prevent them from using our platforms to organize violence or civil unrest. But after the election, Facebook was used by some to organize the January 6th insurrection. Now, for some additional context, apparently the platform got worse as of 2018 when it changed its algorithm. And from there, that's when they really began to prioritize hateful content because that's the thing that gets people coming back. And just for a moment before we go to what the whistleblower says here, think to yourself how these social media platforms keep you engaged. If you're arguing with someone, if you see someone that says something racist, even if you yourself aren't racist, but if you confront someone who said something that's insensitive, you wait for that person to respond, you respond back. It's almost addictive in a sense, in some weird way. So those things, the algorithm picked up on and they knew that that's what keeps you on the platform. So that's why they prioritize hate. They prioritize misinformation, which is why we see so much anti-vax misinformation. They prioritize things that keep people coming back to the platform, even if it's detrimental to humanity, even if it's detrimental to public health, even if it makes society worse off. The whistleblower explains this. You have your phone. You might see only 100 pieces of content if you sit and scroll off for, you know, five minutes. But Facebook has thousands of options it could show you. The algorithm picks from those options based on the kind of content you've engaged with the most in the past. And one of the consequences of how Facebook is picking out that content today is it is optimizing for content that gets engagement or reaction. But its own research is showing that content that is hateful, that is divisive, that is polarizing, it's easier to inspire people to anger than it is to other emotions. Misinformation, angry content yeah. is enticing to people it's and keep, keeps them on the platform. Yes. Facebook has realized that if they change the algorithm to be safer, people will spend less time on the site, they'll click on less ads, they'll make less money. Yeah, so Facebook profits off of making people more hateful, off of making people more misinformed, it's just truly a terrible platform. And again, I want to reiterate that I was disappointed to learn that Facebook came back. Now, you might think that I'm a hypocrite because I am on Facebook. We post humanist report videos to Facebook. And I've actually thought about leaving Facebook, but at the same time, I decided against it because with how much misinformation is on Facebook, with how popular sites like The Daily Poster and Ben Shapiro is on Facebook, any additional voice that's trying to debunk these conspiracy theories about the vaccines, debunk right-wing misinformation, I think it's important. I think that Facebook overall is a net negative for society, but so long as it remains a very popular platform, I do think it's important for leftists such as myself to occupy that space to try to combat it at least a little bit. Maybe 
somebody shares one of my videos about COVID-19 with their anti-vax uncles and it, it gets through, through to them. Like, I don't think that the success rate is that high because, again, the platform is accessible. But if it helps a little bit, then I think that it's worthwhile. Uh, but still, ultimately, I think that the platform is horrible. That's not to say that no good has come out of it because there has been, uh, you know, a lot of people that organized on Facebook. It's a way for people who have disabilities to communicate with others. So it's not all bad, but the way that they designed it specifically is to bring out the worst in people, to misinform people. And that's where the issue comes in. That's why Facebook needs to be broken up. Uh, if I had my way, it would be nationalized. And these social media companies, companies, they have to be regulated. They're basically unregulated. And that's why they're doing things like this. Of course, a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation is going to prioritize profits over people. That's not surprising. We're seeing it with all types of industries as it relates to climate change. So this shouldn't be a shocker. But what it should do is catalyze action from lawmakers and they should force facebook to change their algorithm or at a minimum be more transparent with their algorithm i mean i don't know what else to say about this but facebook is awful and if you have the option you should definitely delete your facebook account but for those of us who are trying to produce content to counter the right wing misinformation i think at least for now it's important to remain on there but i don't know how much longer i think it'll be worthwhile facebook is truly just it's awful the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism published what they're calling the Panama Papers on steroids. I'm, of course, referring to the Pandora Papers. Now, this shows that elites hide their wealth. Not necessarily that shocking of a revelation, of a revelation but still, what they published here is truly substantial. And I suspect that not a lot of mainstream news outlets are going to talk about this. So what is the Pandora Papers? Well, for a summary, we go to Brett Wilkins of Common Dreams, who explains, in what's being called the biggest ever leak of offshore data, a cache of nearly 12 million documents published Sunday laid bare the hidden wealth, secret dealings, and corruption of hundreds of world leaders, billionaires, public officials, celebrities, and others. The leaked documents reveal how some of the world's wealthiest people avert the financial consequences of their misdeeds by using offshore offshore entities. Dozens of current and former world leaders feature prominently in the files, including Russian President Vladimir Putin, Jordanian King Abdallah II, and former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. While most of the richest Americans do not appear in the files, the Washington Post reports that perhaps the most troubling revelations for the United States center on its expanding complicity in the offshore economy. Chuck Collins, author of The Wealth Hoarders, How Billionaires Pay Millions to Hide Trillions, and co-editor of Inequality.org at the Institute for Policy Studies, said in a statement that the U.S. has become the weak link in stopping global crime and wealth hiding. States like South Dakota and Delaware have morphed their laws to attract billions, sometimes illicitly obtained from around the world, he said. We in the U.S. should be embarrassed that we've become a magnet for kleptocratic funds. Collins added that the Pandora Papers show it is time for U.S. lawmakers to shut down the hidden wealth system that allows for such aggressive tax avoidance and the sequestering of wealth. Now, I want to show you this graphic, which uh, demonstrates how U.S. trusts play a role. As you can see, South Dakota with 81, Florida with 37, Delaware with 35, Texas with 24, and Nevada with 14. Uh, they also explain how America's biggest law firm, Baker McKenzie, drives global wealth into tax havens. And there's millions of documents here. And the Pandora Papers is basically, if you go to their website, I'll link to it down below, uh, this is the ICIJ website. It's basically a bunch of different articles that explain some of the findings here. But the TLDR version is that rich people are tax cheats. Not necessarily the most surprising thing in the world. The Panama Papers kind of already proved what we already knew. But this is just further confirmation. The sad part about this is I suspect nothing will come of this. We keep hearing about things like this and nothing happens. We've basically seen not just the race to the bottom in the United States, but a race to the bottom around the world. Oh, and by the way, Shakira was named in the Pandora Papers as well. Another tax cheat. Yeah, I'm not a fan of her, but I know a lot of people who are fans of her and that's going to hurt. So uh, Shakira is canceled, folks. Uh, but I mean, look, in all seriousness, this is serious, but I kind of feel a sense of ambivalence 
But that shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't be numb to this kind of corruption. And maybe I'm projecting, but when we see this, we should feel a general sense of outrage and frustration. But this is just the norm. And I think that everyone knows there's a problem. Most Americans, according to public opinion polls, see that there are issues here with global wealth inequality, but nothing has changed yet. And I feel like there's going to be one catalyst. There's going to be a moment where the dam bursts open, and perhaps this is that moment. But I mean, I think that this will continue to happen, and most people will live their lives, and the wealthy will continue to do things like this, hoard their wealth. And that's that's really sad, but it is an inevitable consequence of capitalism. And when you're in a late-stage capitalist society, this kind of thing is exactly what you'd expect. It's not some sort of inadvertent consequence of the system. This is the intended outcome of capitalism, always. Capitalism always gets so big to where it overpowers governments and eats itself. And, I mean, this kind of confirms that. But I don't, I don't know what to say. I'm not shocked by this at all. And I think that so many people see this and I think, yeah, that's, that's what I expected. But nothing's going to change, so why should I care? And they may be right about that, but this is important. And as desensitized as we all are, we still should care about things like this, as unsurprising as it is, especially to those of us who've been following the corruption of elites for years. So I hope that people actually read some of these details or some of these summaries because this really is unacceptable regardless of how desensitized we are it kind of seems as if dave rubin's grift is starting to fall apart a little bit i don't think it's going to hurt him financially in any way shape or form but i think that he's kind of inadvertently revealing himself and part of this is his own problem, right? He had so much more room for his grift to grow when he still identified as a liberal, but he came out as a conservative, and as a conservative, you have to say certain things. There's this expectation that you will toe the line, but if they think that you're a liberal or a classical liberal, you have more room to kind of reason your way out of difficult situations. So uh, let me give you a couple of examples of that. He was on a television show, and he was debating someone, and she asked for his vaccination status. They were debating vaccines and vaccine mandates, I'm assuming. And watch the way he melts down like a triggered little snowflake. I'll tell you why he got so offended. Yes, children could transmit the disease, although they rarely do. But the parents are all vaccinated if they're good, decent citizens. So I, I don't really understand the connection, actually. Are you a good, decent citizen? Are you vaccinated? It's nobody's business whether I'm uh -huh. vaccinated. That's like me okay. asking you the last time you got laid. I mean, it's just irrelevant. All right. So, you know, what's really relevant is that it's one thing I, if you have the right my, my to medical, choose for my your... medical wait, history wait, just, is not I, your yeah, business, let, nor yours is mine. Let, let Clary finish. I, that hit a nerve. He did not want to answer that question. And I think we all know the reason for that. It's because Dave Rubin is vaccinated. Dave Rubin is vaccinated 100%. The second... He was able to get the vaccine when he was eligible. He was first in line, guarantee it, because he knows that the vaccines are safe and effective. But he doesn't want his audience to know that. And that's why he's pushing this line. Oh, it's nobody's business whether I'm vaccinated. That's like asking me, when's the last time you got laid? Is it, though? Because I don't think that that's the same thing. That's a false equivalence. And you sound really stupid making that point, Dave. We all know that you don't want to disclose your vaccination status for the same reason that Tucker Carlson doesn't want to disclose his vaccination status because that undermines your credibility. And I use credibility very charitably. You undermine your credibility among the anti-vax community that you're pandering to. So if they know that you're vaccinated, then when you tell them that the vaccines are bad, they're going to think, well, wait, if you say that the vaccines are bad, why are you getting the vaccine yourself why did you get the vaccine and the more smart people in his audience there's not many of them but the more smart ones might put two and two together and think wait maybe this person is not walking the walk because what he's saying is bullshit maybe he's telling me what he thinks i want to hear and maybe the vaccine actually is good maybe i should get the vaccine because he got it does he think i'm stupid not many people are gonna are, are gonna realize that but 
still, it makes you look like a fraud if you talk about how bad the vaccines are when you were vaccinated yourself. So that's why he doesn't want to reveal his vaccination status. It's not because it's a deeply personal thing to him. He doesn't care that much. He just doesn't want to give up the game, right? And this is why I say that he had a lot more room for his grift to grow had he remained a public liberal. I don't think that Dave Rubin really has an actual political ideology that he cares deeply about. He's just going to follow the money and wherever that leads him, whatever makes him the most dollars. But I think that if he pretended to be a liberal, he could then say, look, as a liberal, I got the vaccine, but I'm for people making their own medical decisions. I'm for medical freedom. He could use that bullshit line. But instead, he's backed himself into a corner by coming out hard as a conservative, coming out hard against the vaccines, and he doesn't want to disclose that he's vaccinated because he looks like a fraud. So here he is. I mean, look, I am more than willing to disclose my vaccination status. I am fully vaccinated, proudly so, and that doesn't impact my viewership at all, right? You know that I'm vaccinated. You know where I stand entirely. I got the vaccine because I know it's safe and effective, and I want you to get the vaccine because I want you to protect yourself and those around you. I also support vaccine mandates because it's either we mandate vaccines or we have basically this permanent state of plague because anti-vaxxers who are misinformed by people like Dave Rubin, Tucker Carlson, Jimmy Dore, they would keep us in a prolonged state of plague forever if that were possible because they know that anti-vaccine misinformation, fear-mongering about the COVID-19 uh, vaccines, all of that is very, very lucrative. You can monetize that on YouTube and uh, Facebook, whatever platform they're using, and you know you you build up support and trust among your right-wing audience. So they love that but um listen this is how you know that dave rubin is a total fraud because he's using one set of talking points to describe the vaccines when this whole freedom talk contradicts what he says so he was on a libertarian podcast and they question him why are you talking about personal li liberty as it relates to vaccines if you're not in favor of legalizing drugs i thought this this was about bodily autonomy and individual liberty Take a look. He has no idea how to respond. So you describe yourself as a classical liberal. Um, and as such, you're against, I'm assuming, mandating masks and vac vaccines, uh, even if they can be effective in pr protecting public health, because that would interfere with personal liberties of what to do with your body and life. Yet in your book, you oppose the legalization of Schedule One drugs because addiction hurts communities. Why are you willing to sacrifice the civil liberties uh, in, some, in one case uh, for the public good, but not in the other? So when I talk about the drug part, it's like, yeah, I'm for legalizing marijuana. I'm not for mandating that everyone smokes it. I'm for legalizing uh, most psychedelics. But then there's another class of drugs, basically, that are so highly addictive. We all know about, I'm sure you guys cover the, the fentanyl problem we have in the United States, the heroin problem. I was just in New York City, the amount of people that you see on the streets that are just laying there that are obviously on drugs. You go to San Francisco, I mean, go to most progressive cities that you just unfortunately have to balance people's ability to make choices for themselves with some level of public good. So here, here's, a, here's the thing, Vince and Dave, like the classical liberal position is that individual liberty is paramount. And there is nothing more that has to do with your own liberties and freedoms is what to do with your own body. So mm -hmm. if you are going to say that I can't ingest whatever it is in my body, I think the classical liberal position would be, where does it stop? Can I not drink a, a, a big gulp because, you know, it may harm my body and they say sugar is addictive? Where, where does this actually stop? So my question to Dave is really about what, how he identifies as a classical liberal or, or even a libertarian when you're saying that there should be these strict guardrails. And then again, when we're talking about ingesting drugs, that's what I'm putting into my own body. But when we're talking about COVID, that is something that could affect the people around me. So that's a little bit different. And, and so I'm trying to understand how it is you marry those things. That was embarrassing. And whenever Dave Rubin is challenged even slightly, his entire worldview just collapses, which is why he doesn't usually bring on people who's going to challenge him. And 
It's not just that he gets embarrassed when he brings on other people who at least are more intellectually curious and honest and know what they're talking about. He embarrasses himself on a daily basis. Here's another example of him just saying the most idiotic thing he could think of. Some people who don't even work in offices nor ever have worked in offices because they won't get jabbed. I got an email from a guy who's a hospital administrator who has been working at home in his basement for years before COVID. He has now been laid off. Give up a few more of your rights, guys. Why not, you know, Give them access to your bank accounts and your phone records and all that stuff. It's for your own good. They're looking for somebody, a bad person, you know? So just give up some of your rights and, and don't worry. I just don't know how anyone could take Dave Rubin seriously, even right-wingers. If I were a right-winger, I would feel insulted. I would feel like this man was pandering to me. I would feel like he's trying to insult my intelligence. But most right-wingers, to be frank, are rubes and they just want to be told what they want to hear. They just want their worldview to be reinforced. That's why they tune into people like Dave Rubin and Tucker Carlson. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Dave Rubin's grift, it's kind of unraveling. It's kind of unraveling. And it's kind of uncomfortable to watch because we know that he's vaccinated. We know that deep down, if you really could hook him up to a lie detector test or, or give him a truth serum, he would say, yes, the vaccines are safe and effective because that's what facts dictate. I mean, that's that's objectively, objectively true, but he's not going to tell his right-wing audience that because then he looks like a fraud. And, and I love this. Whenever there's an opportunity to expose or embarrass Dave Rubin, somebody should take that opportunity because this man spreads misinformation. He monetizes hate and the spread of bigotry and misinformation. And overall, he doesn't believe a single word that's coming out of his mouth. He's making the world or making the country rather a worse place. And he's doing this because it's profitable. What a piece of shit. I don't know how he sleeps with himself at night, but it's probably on a gigantic bed of money. And that's really gross. I mean, there are some things that are more important in life than money. One of them is living with yourself, being honest with yourself and with your audience. But that's not what he prioritizes. So that's why things like this happen where he looks silly because he doesn't believe in anything. He just is a fucking shameless grifter. Lately, we've been talking more about more unorthodox forms of protest, following senators into bathrooms, showing up to their yachts on kayaks to confront them. And I think that's all really important if these people in power refuse to meet with their constituents, if they're actually doing things that hurt people. But not all protests is made equal. Some protests are actually bad, and quite frankly, they're stupid. So there have been protests in New York City over the vaccine mandates, and the vaccine mandates for teachers went into effect officially this week. And people are very angry about this. So they were marching in the streets, and approximately 8,000 teachers or people with the Department of Education of New York City are going to lose their jobs as a result of this. Now, that sounds like a large number, but it's actually a minority of the total people working for the education system in New York. But there was a large protest. They were marching through the streets of NYC. And at Union Square, there is a COVID testing tent. Now, people who were supposedly against vaccine mandates decided to target the COVID testing tent. You'd think that this wouldn't be relevant to what they're protesting about, because if you're against mandates, in theory, you should be in favor of testing, right? Because testing is what many people can do in lieu of getting vaccinated if they refuse to take the vaccine. But that's not what these people did. They chose to target this uh, COVID testing tent it's a mobile tent that is popped up to help people to help slow the spread and they trashed it take a look
It's really bizarre to me because these people are supposedly against the vaccine mandate specifically, but yet they're booing a COVID testing tent and they're chanting shame on you. But wait, is this about vaccine mandates or COVID testing? Because you claim that you're protesting vaccine mandates, but yet you seem to be pretty offended by a mobile COVID testing tent. And shout out, by the way, to the guy who was doing The Running Man. Uh, that nurse is truly incredible. That is a Chad move right there. There's really no other way to respond to these people. These people are freaks. These people are are genuinely misinformed. And this isn't an image of uh, that protest, to my knowledge. It's from a different event. But look at how misinformed they are. NYS, freedom to fascism. So they believe that... New York City was in a state of freedom until the vaccine mandates took effect, and then all of a sudden, boom, fascism. That's the way it works, apparently. Except vaccine mandates have always existed. They've always existed. They just don't like the COVID vaccine, and maybe many of them are anti-vax, period. They don't like any vaccines. Either way, this isn't some new phenomenon, so these people don't know what they're talking about. And even the thing that they were ostensibly protesting, vaccine mandates, well, they chose to target a COVID testing tent, which has nothing to do with mandates. If anything, that COVID testing tent helps them in many instances, not necessarily here because there's no test out option when it comes to the vaccine mandates pertaining to New York teachers. But still, the, getting tested is the way that... You avoid the vaccine if you're an anti-vaxxer, but yet they trashed the tent. I mean, this is why it's not about the vaccines. It's not about the vaccine mandates. This is about them believing that the government has no responsibility or authority whatsoever to take any measures to try to mitigate the spread of the virus. They're just COVID deniers, period. And they can hide behind medical freedom. They could hide behind what they believe is a violation of the Nuremberg Codes, which it's not. They could hide behind their aversion to vaccine mandates and freedom. But these people are just COVID deniers at this point, and they are functionally fighting on the side of the virus. Otherwise, why else would you attack a COVID tent? You just want the virus to spread. You want less people to get tested. And you want more people to be exposed. And the reason why so many people are against vaccine mandates is because guess what? They work. So as AP reports, a COVID-19 vaccination requirement for teachers and other staff members took effect in New York City's sprawling public school system Monday in a key test of the employee vaccination mandates now being rolled out across the country. Mayor Bill de Blasio said 95% of the city's roughly 148,000 public school staffers had received at least one vaccine dose as of Monday morning, including 96% of teachers and 99% of principals. Some 43,000 doses have been administered since the mandate was announced August 23rd. Bill de Blasio said vaccination rates rose in every school job category after the mandate was announced. District 37 of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, which represents some 20,000 City Department of Education employees, said 93% of those workers had provided proof of at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose as of Sunday, up from 68% at the beginning of September. In other words, Vaccine mandates don't just work. They work really damn well. They're very, very effective. And this isn't the first time that Americans have rebelled against some sort of a mandate in the name of freedom. We were having a really good conversation about this on Thursday on my Patreon chat, where before the last thing, before seatbelts, of course, was uh, public smoking, right? People were so up in arms when they couldn't smoke indoors anymore. 
then there was segregation functionally. There was smoking sections and non-smoking se sections, and they were angered about that because they felt as if they were inferior to their peers because they had to be quarantined in some smoking section. But eventually, smoking was just banned in all indoor spaces, and we still have freedom. Does anyone deny that we have freedom in America because you can't smoke indoors? No, it was a big deal, and then people moved on. Same thing with seatbelts. There were literally people who claimed that they would, wouldn't would drive through states with seatbelt laws because they would not condone that violation of their freedom. Do you see anyone protesting the seatbelt laws now? I mean, when it comes to the original vaccine mandates that are required for your children to be enrolled in public schools, that was controversial not really a thing anymore. So this is just an, another chapter in the long history of Americans being dumb fucks and using their entitlement to not do what is in the interest of public health. But these people are the fringes. They are the minority and history will view them as such. History will look down upon them. Polls show that there is broad support for vaccine mandates. So don't let these fringe lunatics trick you into thinking this is some new authoritarian thing or that it's unprecedented for our country. George fucking Washington supported vaccine mandates. George Washington. And I don't think that these flag humping fuckwads would say that George Washington founder of the country is against freedom would they as they chant 1776 this is not a new thing it's not a new thing vaccine mandates are good and they're good because they're effective and one of the main ways we're going to get out of this pandemic is by vaccinating as many people as possible not just in the united states but around the world and it's especially grotesque to know how petulant americans are being when you consider there are so many people billions of people in other countries who are begging for a vaccine and yet americans are taking that for granted this life-saving medical miracle for lack of a better word they're protesting it and the reason why they're so hostile towards that uh, new york vaccine mandate is because it is more strict than other vaccine mandates it still provides medical and religious exemptions medical exemptions are a necessity of course but religious exemptions that's that shouldn't be a thing that shouldn't be a thing but one reason why they're mad is because this doesn't allow you to test out so unlike other mandates like the one that joe biden instituted and is using uh, doing through osha uh, you can test out, you can get weekly tests, but still that isn't sufficient. And that's not a good way to contain the spread of the virus because in that seven day period, you can get exposed to COVID contracted and spread it to other people. So really the surefire way to contain the virus is to get vaccinated. And when you consider that a university of Oxford study just found that when it comes to the Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines, they actually reduce transmission of COVID-19, including of the Delta variant, albeit to a lesser extent, vaccinations isn't just about protecting yourself. It's about protecting others. It's a public health crisis. So vaccine mandates are good. And those people there are absolutely petulant imbeciles they're morons, and history will remember them as just that. All right, so I am well aware of the fact that whenever we talk about COVID-19 on this channel, it's almost always negative. And there's a lot of bad news. It's a public health crisis, a global pandemic. Of course, there's not going to be that many rosy stories. Having said that, though, this time, in this video, we're going to break the cycle because we actually have some genuinely encouraging news. So first of all, COVID-19 cases in the United States are in fact down and they're down substantially. So we've seen a 24% decline in new cases over the last two weeks, which signals an end to the Delta variant surge, which is great news. Now, second of all, we have multiple studies now confirming just how effective the COVID-19 vaccines are, and they are very very effective. So in early July, researchers at Yale University and the Commonwealth Fund estimated that the COVID-19 vaccines have saved 279,000 lives because of these vaccines. Incredible. And a report from the Department of Health and Human Services found that nearly 40,000 elderly lives were spared between January and May 
because of the COVID-19 vaccines, and they also prevented hundreds of thousands of new infections. Now, as Kenny Stencil of Common Dreams explains, according to the study on the relationship between county-level inoculation rates and COVID-19 outcomes among Medicare beneficiaries, which was conducted by researchers at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, vaccines helped ward off 265,000 infections, 107,000 hospitalizations, and 39,000 deaths during the first five months of 2021. That is absolutely incredible. Hundreds of thousands of lives saved because of the COVID-19 vaccines and 40,000 elderly lives saved during January and May. That is truly remarkable. The vaccines work and they're not just beneficial for you as an individual, but they're great for society as well. In fact, they're really good for society because new research by British researchers at the University of Oxford found that they also reduce transmission. If you've been fully vaccinated, you are less likely to spread COVID-19 to your peers. Now, Dr. Akshay Sahel gives us the breakdown about this new data in an NBC News article and explains people who are vaccinated against COVID-19 are less likely to spread the virus even if they become infected, a new study finds, adding to a growing body of evidence that vaccines can reduce transmission of the Delta variant. British scientists at the University of Oxford examined national records of 150,000 contacts that were traced from roughly 100,000 initial cases. The samples included people who were fully or partially vaccinated with either the Pfizer, BioNTech, or AstraZeneca vaccines, as well as people who are unvaccinated. The researchers then looked at how the vaccines affected the spread of the virus if a person had a breakthrough infection with either the Alpha variant or the highly contagious Delta variant. Both vaccines reduced transmission, although they were more effective against the Alpha variant compared to the Delta variant. When infected with the Delta variant, a given contact was 65% less likely to test positive if the person from whom the exposure occurred was fully vaccinated with two two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. With AstraZeneca, a given contact was 36% less likely to test positive if the person from whom the exposure occurred was fully vaccinated. The risk of transmission from a breakthrough infection was much higher if someone had received just one dose of either vaccine. So this is really, really encouraging. It's, it's great to hear. It's another reason to take the vaccine. If you don't care about yourself, then you should take the vaccine if you care about other people. Now, this study has not been peer-reviewed as of yet, but researchers are confident that this is actually a very high-quality study. In fact, Dr. Aaron Richerman of the University of Pennsylvania says this about the study. It's the highest quality study we have so far on the question of infectiousness of vaccinated people and infected, uh, that are infected with Delta. So this is really, really encouraging news. The vaccines are saving hundreds of thousands of lives, and we're really privileged to have them, to have them not just be free, but widely available, especially considering there are people in developing countries that still haven't even been able to get their first dose. So the fact that we have this here, this truly speaks to the innovations and the amazingness of modern medicine, thanks to government funding as well, but it's important. So the reason why I'm talking about this is because if you're one of the few people who watch this show that aren't vaccinated and you come here just to troll for whatever reason, I mean, the data speaks for itself. This is actual science, unlike the memes that you're sharing on Facebook by your racist aunts and uncles. This is data. This is evidence. So at this point, with everything that we know, with all of the data that we have available, Anyone who's discouraging you from taking the vaccines, any other YouTuber whose video catalog looks like this, they are not to be taken seriously. In fact, with the evidence that we have confirming how effective these vaccines are, this kind of misinformation at this point is bound to get someone killed. But I mean, when you have a conspiratorial right-wing audience to appease, you have to make some sacrifices. And if you gamble with people's lives, I guess some people are willing to pay that price. But for me, no. I'm not willing to pay that price. I want you to protect yourself and others. I want you to get vaccinated. I don't care who you are. If you're a right winger, if you're apolitical, if you hate me, if you hate the humanist report, I don't believe you should die when we have a cure. We have a vaccine that isn't just highly effective as this research shows, but it's also incredibly safe. Millions of people in this country have taken it. Billions of people around the globe have taken it. It's fine. I took it. I'm fine. I haven't spontaneously combusted. 
But, you know, some people have an agenda, like Jimmy Dore. Some people are incredibly irresponsible with their platform, and they don't care if people die. In fact, I don't know what Jimmy Dore believes, but he might believe that he's the one who has the truth. But objectively speaking, he doesn't. These studies show that the vaccines are incredibly effective, and anyone who's telling you to not get them isn't looking out for your best interests. They don't care about you. They care about views and clicks. But this is a public health crisis, and for those of you who are tired of all this talk of lockdowns and masks, the quicker we all get the COVID-19 vaccine, the faster we all go back to normal, which I desperately want at this point. I'm sick of the pandemic, and if you're as tired of this nonsense as I am, get the fucking vaccine so we're not in this perpetual state of plague forever. Now, thankfully, again, cases are down, so I don't want to turn this into a negative video, so I apologize for digressing, but... We've got to get the vaccine. It's available. It's safe. And the best part about it is it fucking works really well. So I think that most of my longtime viewers know that when it comes to pop culture topics, I'm pretty illiterate. In fact, I would argue that I'm totally clueless most of the time. However, when it comes to this particular celebrity that we're going to be talking about today, I actually do have some insight because... I used to consider myself, surprisingly, a pretty big fan of Russell Brand. I love his movies. Forgetting Sarah Marshall, Get Him to the Greek is probably one of my favorite movies ever. And I actually used to watch his YouTube videos all the time. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he talked about. Some of his views were more unorthodox. He would talk about spirituality, which doesn't resonate with me, but he was solidly left-leaning, at least when I watched him. But eventually, I stopped watching his YouTube channel, not necessarily for any particular reason, just because I kind of lost interest. But now, I've learned that he may have taken a very, very bad turn. To the right, at least according to this article published in the Daily Beast, titled, Comedian Russell Brand Has Become a Powerful Voice for Anti-Vaxxers. And the subtitle reads, The comedian seems to have found a loyal fan base in conservatives and anti-vaxxers who have flocked to his YouTube and Facebook accounts for his rambling vaccine-skeptic views. So after not watching his content for years, I will admit it's a little bit heartbreaking to see him take this turn. And I have read through this article already, obviously, in preparation for this video, and I do have some disagreements with the concerns raised by the author here. Having said that, though, when you actually look at his channel, there's a lot left to be desired, to say the least, if I'm being incredibly charitable. And we'll look at his YouTube channel, but first I want to get to the arguments presented by the author in this article. So she writes, The forgetting Sarah Marshall actor has always presented himself as a contrarian, a free thinker, who isn't afraid to challenge established views or spout off at the government both UK and US. But recently, Brand, who has always seemed to skew left in his political beliefs, has found a loyal fan base in right-wing conservatives and anti-vaxxers who have flocked to his YouTube and Facebook accounts, hailing the 46-year-old as a so-called voice of reason. He's played heavy to this fan base, interviewing right-wing trolls Ben Shapiro and Candace Owens, although he does disagree with them on certain points. In June, he asked his watchers if he should accept Fox News' invitation to appear on the network. Most agreed he should. I would suggest Tucker. He's very fair, one fan and commented. The titles of his videos are often designed to delight or infuriate depending on the viewer's political stance, leaning heavily on incredulous clickbait titles such as Thought Biden Couldn't Sink Any Lower? Think again. Did liberals use feminism to justify Afghanistan clusterfuck? Shocking. Wuhan evidence. Did Fauci lie? And so Trump was right about Clinton and Russia. But for the past few weeks, Brand has taken issue with the vaccine, casting doubt on the trustworthiness of the FDA, asked Asking if vaccine mandates are an assault on people's bodily freedoms, calling the vaccine a gold rush, and pondering whether people could trust Bill Gates. Most recently, Brand declared that there was a vaccine apartheid going after CNN anchor Don Lemon after he called out people who refused to get vaccinated. While these videos don't necessarily flop, Brand only recently found his core viewership when he began discussing COVID-19 and political hot topics after Donald Trump left office. So I'll explain to you some of the objections that I take with the author's argument here, but just that last paragraph, it really says a lot. It speaks to a phenomenon known as audience capture, which is when you have this YouTube channel, you've had it for a really long time, and all of a sudden you post a video that gets lots and lots of views. It just inexplicably blows up. 
So then you see the positive feedback, you do it again, and the same result happens. So you enter this sort of feedback loop where you give your audience something that they want, and in return, they reward you with views, clicks, and engagement, which is everything on YouTube. The issue with audience capture and the issue with this feedback loop in, in general is that you, in the long term, ultimately cultivate this audience that expects you to give them a particular thing, and the more you do it, the more difficult it is to break out of that cycle, and that's an issue. Having said that, though, I don't agree with all of the points made by the author. Um, Bill Gates is a trash person who's untrustworthy. I think that you can be pro-vaccine and also hate Bill Gates and think that he's a scumbag, especially if you are pro-vaccine because he doesn't want to release the uh, patents for the COVID-19 vaccines so developing countries can manufacture their own versions, uh, generic versions of the COVID-19 vaccines. So I don't take issue with that. The clickbait titles, I mean, this is something that we're all guilty of on YouTube. It's just part of the game. I don't blame him for that. A lot of the topics I, I don't really find interesting, but it's general anti-establishment type of topics that he talks about. On top of that, when it comes to him platforming people like Candace Owens and Ben Shapiro, I don't really care if he is in fact challenging them, which the author does say that he does. Now, some of the portions of this article that I actually take issue with and disagree with is how they pick out certain comments and they essentially attribute these bad comments to Russell Brand. Now, I will say that you can kind of get a sense of what the creator talks about pretty frequently by gauging the audience and, and how they talk about things. So it can be useful, but the couple of anecdotes here, it's not sufficient to lead me to believe that he is as bad as the author is implying, at least just by reading this. But there's a big but here. If you look at his YouTube channel, um, it does point to a really, really bad trend. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things in here that give me Dave Rubin vibes, to say the least. Now, this is a sample of videos that he posted from the last month, and some of these titles were actually named in the article. But I mean, just right off the bat, you can see how clearly all of his videos overall are skewed towards the right, just based on the titles alone. That doesn't mean that all of his videos are bad, but just overall, I mean, what is the message that you think he's sending? Who do you think he's appealing to based on this superficial glance so far at his video titles? So, I mean, look at this one. Joe Rogan and Ivermectin. Should COVID be politicized? Well, no, it shouldn't be politicized, obviously, but this title suggests that Joe Rogan isn't the one who's politicizing the pandemic by making his refusal to get vaccinated about freedom and by opting for alternative treatments that haven't been proven to actually be successful at treating COVID-19 like ivermectin. So who's the one that's politicizing it? I mean, that's left up to interpretation, but if you look at all of his videos in some... I mean, I think you kind of get a sense. Let's look at some of these titles here. Is the vaccine an assault on your bodily autonomy? Question mark. Mm, no. Can we really trust vaccine fact checkers? COVID and health. Why can't we talk about the science? This is why you can't trust Big Pharma. And you see the FDA logo right there implying that maybe the emergency authorization isn't sufficient enough for us to trust it because you see some sort of a pay to play thing going on on the you know that thumbnail so without even clicking a single video just by browsing his catalog you can easily deduce that he's appealing to one particular crowd of people anti-vaxxers by looking at all of these titles if you step back in some you kind of put them together like pieces to the puzzle when you see the complete puzzle there's this tacit implication that maybe the vaccines are bad. If the FDA is lying to me and COVID-19 is being politicized and Fauci is lying, maybe the vaccines are bad. Now, he doesn't explicitly say that, so he does give himself plausible deniability. Having said that, though, when you actually watch the videos, which I have a couple that we're, we're going to take a look at here, He's not doing himself any justice here. So take a look at Exhibit A. This is the video titled, uh, Are Vaccine Mandates an Assault 
on your bodily freedom. Vaccines are now being mandated for businesses with more than 100 employees. This is going to affect 80 million American people. Is this an intrusion on your rights? Do you trust your government to have that amount of authority? Are these necessary measures or is this situation being mobilized for political ends? <laughs> Now, as ever, when talking about this subject, it's necessary for me to express my neutrality. I am Switzerland when it comes to this subject. No view at all. I am merely a floating series of molecules, spores in space that, through the spike protein, could attach to something. Now, I'm completely neutral. Let's see what this uh, New York Times journalist, Robbie Sove, had to say. In December 2020, the prospect of imminent mass vaccination against COVID-19 was becoming a reality and Biden said he would not force anyone to get the jab. No, I don't think it should be mandatory, he told reporters. I wouldn't demand it be mandatory. So Biden, however you see Biden, and increasingly post-Afghan war withdrawal situation, he is receiving a little more criticism even from his traditional supporters, is changing. We're seeing that ordinary process, campaign promises, what takes place in action. You know what my position is. This is an area where I can declare what I feel. I'm neither left nor right because I don't believe in centralized bipartisan democracy. So I'm not a socialist or a Marxist. I agree with kindness, compassion, sharing, service, supporting one another. And I can talk about the administrative underwriting of those emotions because all governmental systems are ultimately leaning into an emotion somewhere along the line. They have to because otherwise, you know, what is humanitarianism? Why protect human beings at all? So just by watching that short clip, you kind of get a sense of what he's doing here. He's not explicitly saying that vaccine mandates are an assault on your freedom. He's not saying that vaccines are bad. But he kind of gets you to think about these things. He gets you to a certain conclusion by using innuendo and priming. And I think it's really slimy, especially because you can see what he was doing there. He was presenting himself as an enlightened centrist. I'm not left. I'm not right. I'm perfectly neutral. Except, no, you're not. You can try to pretend to be neutral, but when we look at your video catalog, and in particular your titles, you're very clearly creating this content for one particular group of people. Uh, and... When you title a video, vaccine mandates an assault on your bodily freedom, and the entire setup is that Biden went back on his promise. I mean, even if you don't explicitly say that vaccine mandates are indeed an assault on bodily autonomy, who is this supposed to appeal to? And the person who you're obviously appealing to, what do you think their conclusion is going to be when you present them with this question? I think it's pretty obvious what he's doing. Now, let's go to another uh, video. I present you with Exhibit B. The left versus right culture war conflagration continues to increase in temperature and many people are asking, are we on the brink of civil war? Well, Tim Poole, when I spoke to him on my podcast, Under the Skin, available from Luminary, you can get it on Apple, link in the description, says we're already in a war. The war has begun. It's just being practiced on the level of psyche. We're in the middle of a psychological war being subtly fought through media and sometimes not so subtly fought. An invasion of the mind. Policemen of the brain. Tim Poole is a great and influential orator. Have a look at this clip from Under the Skin. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Stay to the very end because some interesting points are made. <coughs> Uh, actually, there's a story right now. A journalist was attacked by anti-fascists in, I believe it was in Portland. There's a video of it. You can actually watch the video of them calling her a slut, shoving her to the ground, spraying her with paint and, and, and macing her. And right now, if you go on Twitter, all of left Twitter says it was actually the Proud Boys. They are, they are so tribalist on, on, on their worldview, they will not accept fault for their own side. And Obviously, I think the right has its faults. I think the Proud Boys who show up to fight are causing, you know, equal trouble to a certain degree. And people have just, they have their sides. They, they want to fight. They're, they're not interested in what is true. They're interested in what they believe. And they're interested in confirmation bias. I think when independent voters start swinging away from Biden, which they are, and they might vote for Republicans, which I don't necessarily think solves any of the problems, you'll end up with a massive reaction on a scale much worse than we saw in 2020 with the riots. Because people are entrenched. You know, they don't want to back down from what they believe to be true or their worldview. And I think uh, uh, just one final thought on this, a simple way to explain the difference. I do not think you will ever see 
uh, a large movement of Trump supporters embracing critical race applied principles, uh, critical race praxis. You will see that, uh, you know, the, the left will obviously be very much in favor of their vision of equity and equal outcomes and, um, you know, racial quotas. The right won't do that. And so long as you have two governments, uh, uh, you know, fighting over control of one centralized system where they want to implement their moral framework, I think it ultimately ends up with some kind of implosion. So ask yourself, who is this for? Is this for left wingers? You have Tim Pool here attacking the left, saying that they're as bad as Proud Boys and that they're tribalistic and they're very biased. And the right has their problems, too. But I mean, the left, let me tell you about the left with their critical race theory peddling uh, nonsense racial quotas. Who is this for? Come on. This isn't for left-wingers. This is for right-wingers. Right-wingers who are tuning in because now they realize that Russell Brand is going to tell them exactly what they want to hear. He's going to reinforce their worldviews. And maybe he doesn't reinforce their worldviews explicitly, but he gives them enough, presents them with enough information to where they can make their own decision, even though they've kind of been led to that particular place. Now, one last clip that I want to show you. This is from the Nicki Minaj COVID vaccine testicle discourse that I thankfully missed uh, when it was taking place. Take a look. Nicki Minaj is there to have an opinion on a controversial subject and is now getting the ire of the government and commentators everywhere. Should public figures and celebrities and that be able to say stuff or is it irresponsible and should it be stamped out or does it depend if they're parroting your perspective or not? Let's work it out right now. And became impotent after getting the COVID jab. Also, like this news is framing it as a series of anti-vax tweets, i.e. it belongs to a genre, which I think is a little unfair because there's some of the most personal and particular information I've ever read in text form. I should clarify at this point that I have no opinion on any medical crisis or pandemic treatment of what you should do as an individual or any opinions about anything. See me as sort of like a glass sphere floating through space that information just goes through. So just pray on it and make sure you're comfortable with your decision and not bullied. Now that suggests that Nicki Minaj's general view is that it should be an individual choice made by uh, each of us individually. Cool Nicki Minaj. I guess it's like Nicki Minaj is being utilised by any side on this argument. People that are circumspect, hesitant, cynical about the vax, concerned about the reporting of anomalies will think, ah, oh, Nicki Minaj freedom fighter. People that are like, no, just get vaccinated. This is an unprecedented crisis. Nicki Minaj, she stepped out of line. If a celebrity says something that's a bit mad, they're a celebrity. And if you agree with them, cool, you, you're into them and you like them. If you disagree with them, well, well you know, they're a celebrity. Right? Everyone gets all serious. Oh, no, but with your platform, with your platform, you should be saying what I would say if I had your platform. That's not how reality works. People are all different. No. See, that right there is what I take issue with. Using your platform responsibly doesn't mean that you can't share your own opinions, even if they're spicy. But using your platform responsibly means that you very clearly differentiate between what are facts and opinion. If I say it's my opinion and people know it's my opinion, no harm, no foul. But what Nicki Minaj did there is she didn't just dare to share her bold opinion. She presented an anecdote and made it seem as if this is some widespread phenomenon. She implied that there's a cause and effect relationship between the vaccines and impotency. That's not her just sharing her opinion. That's her sharing incorrect facts or what people will perceive to be facts about the COVID-19 vaccines that may persuade people to not get the vaccines themselves. And what we know so far based on facts is that the vaccines have saved hundreds of thousands of lives. So by her saying that, Having one of her impressionable fans view that, they might think, wow, well, I don't want my, my testicles to swell up. I guess I should probably avoid getting the vaccine. That's dangerous. And again, he presented himself as a neutral arbiter of information here. But when you look at his channel, he's obviously deliberately trying to appeal to a very specific group of people. So I find it especially disingenuous and slimy if you're going to clearly pander to anti-vaxxers. That's what he's doing. Come on but yet still claim, oh, well, I'm neutral. Mm, no, you're not. You're, you're pretty clearly taking a position. You don't have to take a position explicitly. To take a position, you, you can take 
a position implicitly. You can say things without saying them directly. And that's what he's doing here. It's pretty obvious. So I've seen enough. This is um not good, Russell Brand. I mean, I'm not going to say that he's as bad as Tucker Carlson or even Jimmy Dore for that matter. And I don't agree with all of the points of contention in the article. But I mean, he's undeniably a powerful voice for anti-vaxxers, given how big his platform is at this point and how famous he is. And even if it could be a lot worse than I was expecting after having read that article... It's still not helping us during a public health crisis. This isn't helpful. You're pandering to anti-vaxxers. He knows it. He could be in denial, but this is the result of audience capture. And it's bad overall. You're not helping us get the virus under control by implicitly discouraging people to take the vaccine. And during a public health crisis, I, I just, I don't appreciate that. And I find it especially gross when you very clearly present a particular skewed image to people and a narrative to people but yet you claim that you're just some neutral arbiter who's sitting in the middle you're not taking a stand you're not left you're not right you're totally above the frame no you're not you're now functionally in the camp of right wingers at least on this issue and it's not a good look when it comes to John Hickenlooper, there's two things that everyone should know. The first is that he watched porn with his mom. I'm not kidding about this. So I took my mother to see Deep Throat. And... <laughs> Told you. And the second thing you should know is that he is, for some reason, conspicuously concerned with the profits of Facebook. So during the Facebook whistleblower's testimony before the Senate Commerce Committee, he inquired about Facebook's profits. And... You know, at first, this isn't necessarily too weird, but I'll show you his question followed by her answer. Obviously, Facebook can manipulate its algorithms to attract users. Um, and I guess my question would be, do you feel, in your humble opinion, that, you know, simply maximizing profits, no matter the societal impact, that that, that is justified? Um, and I think... The question then would be, that that's the, the short question, which I think I know the answer. What impact uh, Facebook's bottom line would it have if the algorithm was changed to promote safety uh, and to, instead of, to pr change to, to, to save the lives of young women rather than putting them at risk? Um, Facebook today, uh has a, a, a profit, is, uh, makes approximately $40 billion a year in profit. A lot of the changes that I'm talking about are, are not going to make uh, Facebook an, an unprofitable company. It just won't be a ludicrously profitable company like it is today. Um, Engagement-based ranking, which causes those amplification problems that leads young women from you know, innocuous topics like healthy recipes to anorexia content. Um, if it were removed, People would consume less content on Facebook, but Facebook would still be profitable. And so uh, I, I, I encourage oversight and public scrutiny into how these algorithms work and the consequences of them. Okay, so in short, yes, Facebook would indeed lose profits if they changed the algorithm. Now, this isn't the most bizarre question for a lawmaker to ask, knowing that these private companies have a fiduciary responsibility to increase shareholder value, of course, they're not going to willingly do something that hurts their bottom line. So you need to know whether or not this is the case so you can figure out the right course of action to take. And in this instance, of course, you should do regulations because knowing that Facebook is a greedy company with one goal to make money, they're not going to willingly change something that uh, you know makes them so much money so that means you have to force them to make this change via regulation so at that point in time you get your answer of course you move on to the next topic except john hickenlooper stays on the topic of facebook's bottom line a little bit longer with another question i'm a former small business owner i owned a yeah. uh started a brew pub back in 1988 uh and really was always we worked very hard to to look, again, we weren't doing investigations, but we were very sensitive to whether someone had had too much to drink, whether we had a frequent customer who was frequently putting himself at risk and, and others. Um, obviously, I think the, the Facebook business model puts, uh, well, poses risk to, to youth and to, and to teens. Uh, you compared it to cigarette 
companies, mm -hmm. which I thought was rightfully so. Um, if this, I guess the question is, is this level of risk appropriate? Uh, or is there a level of risk that mm -hmm. would be appropriate? Okay, so that's kind of a weird question. This is the former Facebook product manager, not an expert in sociology, John. So I guess I just don't really follow what your point is. Are you implying that overall it's worse for society if Facebook loses their profits? I, I, I What are you getting at, right? And she made a pretty solid point about the fact that, you, you know, it, it might hurt them in the short term, but in the long term, if they change this algorithm and they don't willingly promote hate for purposes of profit, it could help them with future revenue. Because if less people are leaving the platform because it's so toxic, maybe that helps them in the long term. So you'd think, all right, we've got two questions about Facebook's profitability. It's time to either yield back your time or move on. Well, no, he brings up profits again. Um, I also thought that the... Um the question of, of how do we assess the impact to their bottom line. Uh, we had a representative of Facebook in here recently who talked about that eight out of 10 uh, Facebook users feel their life is better and that their job is to get to 10 out of 10. Maybe this is the 20% the that they're missing. I don't know how large that the demographic is of, of people that are caught back up into this circuitous, uh, circuitous uh, you know, sense of, of, of really taking them down into a, 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 the wrong direction, how many people that is. Do you have any idea? Okay, this is strange. You no longer sound like a politician who's inquiring about a company's policy. You sound like a businessman who's weighing the pros and cons about the short and long-term profits of a company. It's almost like he has stock in the company. Like, that's what it sounds like to me, except that's exactly the case. He's asking these questions. He's so concerned about Facebook's profits because he literally has stock in the company. As Donald Shaw of Sludge reports, while inquiring on Facebook's bottom line, Hickenlooper is invested in the company. The senator's Facebook shares are worth as much as $500,000 dollars. So he was presumably concerned about Facebook's profits because it also impacts his wallet as well. This is an obvious, obvious conflict of interest. And lawmakers shouldn't be allowed to have stocks. Why are they allowed to own stocks in companies that they're supposed to be regulating? Doesn't this seem kind of fucked up? Doesn't this seem like a system that is designed to fail and skew towards the business class of the United States? That's exactly the case. And it gets worse than that because it's not just that he's overly curious about Facebook's profits. It also influenced him as a lawmaker. It influences what he chooses to support and not support. So Shaw adds, the senator is not a co-sponsor of the major democratic antitrust bill, the Competition and Antitrust Law Enforcement Reform Act, introduced in February by Senator Amy Klobuchar. The only bill Hickenlooper is co-sponsoring in the science, technology, communications policy area, according to Congress.gov, is a bill from Republican Senator Roger Wicker that, according to a summary from Senator Hickenlooper and Wicker, would require the National Telecommunications and Information Administration to establish a test bed to develop and demonstrate innovative supply chain technologies and applications and establish a grant program to promote the participation of U.S. companies in international standard setting bodies. The bill is intended to help U.S. companies develop new products to compete with Chinese competitors. Hickenlooper, who is worth at least $7.8 million on stock in several other tech companies, including Microsoft, Automatic Data Processing, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Intel, and NVIDIA. So there you have it. That's why he's so concerned with Facebook's profits. That's why presumably he's not signing on to legislation that would hurt Facebook because it would hurt their bottom line. So this is why these sorts of conflicts of interest shouldn't exist. This is why lawmakers shouldn't be allowed to own stocks in companies that they're supposed to be regulating. But it's sort of a difficult situation to get out of because how do you convince lawmakers who all own stocks in different companies and industries to pass legislation that bans them from owning stocks in industries? I mean, it's it's like them cutting off their own noses to appease everyone else. And 
they're not going to do that. They're not going to do something that would impact them and their bottom line. And John Hickenlooper is a multimillionaire. He doesn't need to be concerned with Facebook bringing in additional profits. But this is the game. This is the way that it's played. And it's sickening, but it's not surprising. So by now, I'm sure that most of my audience is kind of tired of these Caitlyn Jenner gubernatorial run stories, especially considering that she barely got 1% of the vote. But I want to talk about this story because it's just one of those stories that I enjoy so much for no particular reason. Maybe it's schadenfreude. Maybe it's just that I, I like seeing dumb people get proven wrong when things are pretty obvious. Either way, she basically explains that she had a lot of meetings with Republican politicians, and many of them did not want to be seen publicly with her. They were embarrassed of her. Hmm, I wonder why. Why would Republicans who are transphobic not want to meet with somebody who's transgender? I wonder why. Even if she's a Republican, perhaps it's because they're bigots. But either way, uh, what she says is... Uh, it's fascinating to me, to say the least. So LGBTQ Nation reports, Caitlyn Jenner said that during her failed California gubernatorial campaign, some Republican Party leaders and elected GOP officials refused to be seen in public with her, despite supporting her in private. I had elected officials and party leaders who would gladly take private meetings with my campaign team and me, but would balk at the mere notion of being seen publicly with me, Jenner wrote in a recent USA Today column. She would have been the first transgender governor in the United States had she won. To a point, I understand they have to protect themselves from their voters and base who might not be as open-minded as they are, she explained, noting that the problem for someone like myself is partly generational. But leadership means standing up for what is right, and if you thank me privately for running for office, you should be able to do it publicly. Despite association with her being treated like a dirty secret, Jenner assures readers that she is still a Republican and will fight for inclusivity in the Republican Party. That's gonna go well. She even complains that coming out as a Republican was more difficult than coming out as transgender. So I just love that even as she explains to all of us how Republicans were literally embarrassed to be seen with her in public, even if they privately supported her, she's still a Republican. She's still loyal to the party. She still is making sure that that Republican victim narrative is, is a thing. No, it's, it's harder for me to come out as a Republican than it is to come out as transgender. Is it, though? Is it, though? Really? Okay, maybe that's true in her case because she is a multimillionaire and she's older and she's not living with her parents who, you know, you may rely on for housing, as is the case with trans youth. But I, I just, we're to a point where I can't do anything but laugh at this. What did you expect, Caitlin? What did you expect? This is a classic leopards ate my face situation where somebody was totally surprised that a leopard ate their face after they voted for the leopards eating people's faces party. I just, I don't understand how you would expect something like this. It's like you are running as a Democrat and your, your number one thing is that you want to ban abortions. The party kind of is against that. So what are you trying to do here? I mean, perhaps when it comes to economic issues, she is conservative because she's rich and she's looking out for her own self-interest. But still, I mean, you can't pretend to be surprised that this transphobic party that made it their mission, especially in 2021, to demonize trans youth, they're against you. How is that surprising to you? This party has always been bigoted. This, this party has always used social issues and culture war issues to get elected. They offer voters nothing. So what do they do? They prey on people's bigotry. They prey on racism and xenophobia and transphobia and homophobia. That's what they do. They've been doing this forever. So for you to be shocked, to have a surprised Pikachu face when they're like, mm, I don't want to be seen with you in public. What did you expect, Caitlin? What did you expect? Jesus Christ. She's like a less self-aware version of Blair White. It, it's just, it, she's insufferable. Now, to make matters worse, I want to remind everyone that it's not just that she was transgender as part of the reason why she lost and didn't even barely reach 1%, or she did, but she barely got 1%. Either way, 
Remember how bad her campaign was, and that also tells you a little bit about why she wasn't successful. So during her campaign, she pulled at 6% for public support, lied about not voting for Trump in the 2020 election, had an inconsistent stance on COVID-19 mask wearing, complained about seeing homeless people in the streets, expressed some support for Texas's bounty hunting anti-abortion law, left her campaign to go record a reality show in Australia, and ended up having to fund her own impoverished campaign. I mean, you might think that she's just a really bad candidate, but I'm sure she'll use the footage that she shot from her campaign to make some reality show. She might already have a reality show that I'm unaware of. Maybe it's like in its ninth season. I don't know. But she's just so insufferable, so clueless, so insufferable. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. So, I mean, when she says things like this, yeah, I can't believe that the Republican Party is transphobic. They literally chased you out of CPAC, chanting transphobic bullshit at you. This party doesn't want you, Caitlyn Jenner. So you have to choose. Do you actually care about transgender Americans and their suffering and the bigotry perpetuated by the party that you identify with? Or do you care about your own personal wealth? So what do you care more about? Class solidarity or solidarity with the LGBTQ plus community? Well, I think that she's already made that decision. She's already stated her position loud and clear. So now she shouldn't be surprised when her party rejects her because they're against you. They don't support you having the freedom to be you. They're against you. They're bigots. This is kind of obvious. So don't be surprised when they treat you like shit. So I wanted to share a story with you out of the state of Alabama. It's a really encouraging, inspiring story, and it really demonstrates what's possible if political leaders actually listen to the will of the people. Of course, I'm just kidding. It's Alabama. It's a train wreck. The story's depressing. <laughs> it speaks to how morally depraved our late stage capitalist society is. And I mean... I don't even know what to say about it. I can't really supplement this article that I'm about to read to you with much commentary because I think it kind of speaks for itself. The details here, they're gross enough to where there's not much to be said about this, but still, I can't not talk about this because it's just, it's so, it's so egregious. It's so gross. So CNN's Rebecca Reese and Devin M. Sires reports, Alabama Governor Kay Ivey signed into law Friday a number of prison infrastructure bills that will use coronavirus relief funds to build new prisons in the state, calling it a pivotal movement for the trajectory of our state's criminal justice system. How inspiring. Ivey, a Republican, had convened a special session of the Alabama legislature to discuss how to fix what she has called a decades-long problem of prison infrastructure challenges. The governor said Friday's bill signing was the culmination of hard work and conversations between lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. I'd like to personally offer my thanks to the legislative leadership who are standing behind me right here for a successful special session and what we believe will yield untold benefits to all Alabamians in the days ahead, Ivy said. You can't be serious. Earlier this week, Ivy defended her proposal to use the state's allotment of COVID-19 relief funds to build prisons after receiving criticism from Democrats. Their proposal included using up to 400 million of federal COVID-19 relief money, up to 785 million in bonds, and no more than 154 million from the state general fund to add prisons and renovate others. The state legislature gave the package final approval on Friday. Yeah, that's the story. Now, I shouldn't have to say this, but there are virtually endless possibilities for that money. I mean, she should actually be using it for COVID relief. Alabama has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country, with only 43% of residents fully vaccinated and 53% with at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccines. So she could have used this money to set up mobile COVID vaccine sites in the most rural areas of the state. You could do that. You can do a lot of things. You can uh, put it towards education, housing. You can set up a fund for low-income residents to give them health care if, you know, Medicaid isn't doing the trick. There's so much that you could do. She's using it to build prisons. I just, what do you even say? That really speaks to her priorities as a governor. And 
this is kind of just microcosm of a bigger issue. We always spend more money uh, when it comes to killing people, at least when it comes to what we're allowed to change, right? The discretionary budget in Congress, most of the time, more than half of that is spent on killing people and blowing up people. And in Alabama, they're using it to send people to prison. When are we as a society going to stop accepting this from politicians? When are we going to stop electing politicians that prioritize locking people up and killing people over actually helping people? I don't know, but there's not much left to say about this. I just wanted to share it because this is kind of not the most shocking story to see out of a late stage capitalist society. And it's never been a shocking story as it relates to Alabama because... It's Alabama. But having said that, though, I couldn't not talk about this because Jesus Christ, what what a fucked up thing. What a, what a ridiculous thing to use COVID-19 relief funds while the pandemic is still going on to build pres prisons. Just Jesus Christ. Hi, folks. I'm here with Sam, a.k.a. the Khaleesi from the Reset Race podcast, and she is here to talk about a really important issue, and that is the disappearance of black wealth in the United States of America. And uh, there's a really clear solution for this. It's reparations. And she has all the details that I think you need to know. Uh, so, Sam, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Like, I'm really excited to be here. Like, I was telling you, I'm a casual watcher. So I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I want to thank say you. thank you to Brian. Because Brian, when you asked yes. the people, he jumped in right away. So I want to make sure I say thank you to Brian. Shout out to Brian. Brian is very excited that this is happening. Brian is, is great. I love him. He's one of my mods. So yeah, thank you so much uh, for the recommendation. I've heard of the Reset Race uh, podcast before. I didn't know that it was Actify, but rebranded. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've known Michael Graham for a while. I brought him on the show at one point to talk about reparations. So this isn't necessarily reparations 101 for my viewers. But I, I, since then, I've had more people tune in. And I casually will mention reparations here and there. But I think from time to time, it's really important to revisit it and dive back in. Because every once in a while, what I'll notice is that there's people that will talk about reparations, but it's not necessarily an intellectually honest conversation. Or if they talk about reparations, it's their interpretation of reparations, which isn't the interpretation of the people who actually are fighting for it on the ground. Eidos 101, uh, the Reset Race podcast. So I, I, I want you to kind of give my viewers the uh, precise definition of reparations um, because there's... And maybe it's not necessarily, maybe it's hard to do that. But oftentimes what I see is reparations broken down into two different distinct categories. Reparations is either one, uh, distributing wealth into black communities that's missing or two, cutting a check. And as my understanding is it should be both, but ultimately the bottom line is you should cut a check. A check is really what's owed, not just morally, but legally. And there's there's so many different ways that you can attack this argument. Uh, they're all compelling to me. But in your view, what is reparations? And if somebody doesn't necessarily know, how should they understand it? So I, I'm, I'm going to actually pull up the official definition and then I'll go in deeper. There we that. go. Because I think we should just start with a good old fashioned encyclopedia that's Definitely. always the safest bet. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's just easier for people, right? Because yeah. everybody, like, you know, these days people are like, oh, we should do some, we should do a, we should do a housing program. That's reparations. And it's just everything right. reparations. So reparations, just the basic, to, the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wrong. The action of repairing something. So Reparations, the way that Black Americans who descend from chattel slavery, the ADOS movement, the U.S. Freedmen, we are looking for, uh, we are actually looking for multiple programs and also a check to be involved as well. Because the thing about the racial wealth gap is you can't close it with just programs. Because this is the thing. So everybody's like, well, let's give people free college, which, you know, sounds great, right? Free college, that's the gateway to opportunity. Well, Black college graduates have less wealth than white high school dropouts. So that's not the equalizer. We tried that for 30, 40 years. So 
it's just there's a bunch of there's a bunch of different things that people are like well if we do this we'll give people free college oh well we can help people with down payments for homes well that sounds great but if i have a 450 credit score <laughs> your 25 or 30 thousand dollar assistance is not getting me into anything because i have bad credit or or i don't have a good enough job or i'm not stable so basically what reparations would do for black americans is basically just make us stable so with Darity's numbers, he's talking about seven around seventeen trillion dollars per family. Or not sorry, not per family, seventeen trillion dollars total. So right. for that, I like to look at it as a down payment. But you know, if we, people should go with Darity first, because you know the rest of us are like, no, we want more. So go with the man who's trying to <laughs> go with the man who's trying to be sensible, because we like Thomas Kramer's numbers, and he's talking about quadrillions. So you know, maybe mm. y'all should listen to Darity a little bit more. But um, it would basically be about eight hundred thousand dollars per family, give or take. And that actually, when somebody hears that, they might think, "Oh, that's that's inconceivable in the United States." But a lot of people don't realize that we actually did distribute reparations before, not mm -hmm. to descendants of slaves, but to uh, the families of victims of Japanese internment. And the individual who signed that into law, the president who signed that into law, was Ronald Reagan of all people. So to think that it's inconceivable, it's not just in this political context that we're in. I feel like. We're, we're made to believe that this is such a weird, absurd, mm -hmm. kooky concept. But it, it's not just a necessity because black wealth is disappearing at a rate that should alarm everyone. But it's also morally ne necessary. Yeah. And the legal argument is sound. It is what is owed. And it's a debt that has never been paid. And I think that there's there's a variety of ways that you can reason yourself into supporting it legally, morally, out of necessity. But either way, it's something that to me is non-negotiable. And with how fast black wealth is disappearing, I don't see how this isn't a really huge topic. Now, one thing that I wanted to ask you about is for the first time ever in the uh, House of Representatives, there was actually a hearing on HR 40, which yeah. was no, originally- not, not the hearing. The hearing was was last, was 2019. That was the first one. The markup. Mm -hmm was the first Mark time ever. Okay, yes. right, we right. finally got it to a markup because it's the hearing first, then a markup, then if right. they want to, they vote. Or you hit 218 co-sponsors and they have to vote. Which is, honestly, it's it's incredible to, to know that it got that far. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're, we're far behind, but the fact that it's there it is great. Talk to us about the significance of that process and your thoughts on how it played out overall, because I think this is really important because this is the first time we've seen movement. And all I, that I expected from politicians was for them to try to placate uh, supporters of reparations. But this is a little bit different. We have members of Congress actually pushing it, which is incredible. So talk through that process. So I'm going to start off by giving Yvette Carnell credit. So Yvette Carnell basically motivated a lot of people across this country to get active. So mm -hmm. basically what happened from there is people started organizing. They started doing campaigns. I, I literally berated my congresswoman on Twitter for about four weeks. So she was like, no, 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 I already signed HR 40. They just haven't added my name to the list. Like we literally, cause originally I think when it started, when we started dealing with it, it had like 40 or 50 co-sponsors, we're up to 196. We, That's incredible. We, we did a campaign. We would call their offices. We had scripts. We had, like we were not playing around. So we still haven't gotten where we need to be with it. But it, to be honest, it was a grassroots joint effort of a bunch of ADOS people who are like, you are going to pay attention to us and our issues. And we haven't gotten it to the vote yet. But, you know, if we could get what it's like, I, said, I think we have 196. You need 218 to force a vote. So. And we can get more people to start calling their congressmen and asking about why they haven't done HR 40. And it'd be great if they're not all black people. If they start hearing from white people about this too, it's gonna matter because a lot of times they feel like, oh, white people don't, white people aren't gonna like this, so I'm not gonna talk about it. So if you start calling them and talking about it, they're gonna be like, uh oh, this is gonna be something that I have to add into what's going on. So I'm excited about the movement, but we're still not where we need to be yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is, in terms of having conversations about reparations, white people, 
how do we and i mean i i'm i'm the white ally so i'm the one who should be trying to facilitate this but it's it's difficult because at the same time i want to be an ally but i don't want to talk out of turn um so how do you think we bring people on this is one thing that i that i find um that is kind of the issue is that people there's this tendency even on the left especially on the left they kind of prioritize universal policies and anything yes. that disproportionately helps one group of people they they tend to think you know what that's not going to be popular it's not going to mm -hmm. gain any momentum but i think that we've really kind of misconstrued what reparations is to an extent at least as leftists broadly speaking i don't view this as a race-based policy even though it is that right mm -hmm. um this is basically a program that does more than help ados this is a program that would boost the economy yes. overall if mm -hmm. black americans have wealth then unlike billionaires they reinvest that into the economy, into their exactly. communities. And kind of like this, this is like the inverse of trickle down where a rising tide lifts all boats, where if you actually invest money into the economy, uh, black people will spend that money in white businesses, in black businesses. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily just um, a, a policy that exclusively uh, benefits ADOs. But at the same time, I, I, there's the, almost this assumption that we can't walk and chew gum at the same time or this implication where it's like, well, if I, if I support reparations, then I have to uh, put Medicare for all on the back burner when we need all of it. We Thank need universal you. programs and that. Like, so I mean, <laughs> I feel right now, I'm just like, yeah. listen, there's no, we can no longer do piecemeal anything. So like, right. reset, reset race, like we're reparations first. But we want a bundle. We're like, give us reparations in like the same day, you know, put the other bill next to it and let's have a federal jobs guarantee and some Medicare for all and some housing as a human right. And like we are we are down for the fight. We are down to yeah. fight for everybody to get everything that their families need. But reparations is the cost of doing business because mm -hmm. historically it's so this is the thing, right? Um, when Thomas Kramer who is um who is a I think he's like a historian, but he also is, uh works on he does some economic work with mm. Verity, and he talks about reparations and he did calculations. That's how he got to the quadrillion number. So he talks about the reason why he likes um likes America because he's from Germany. The reason why he mm. likes um the history of America so much is because of the fact that there was always white resistance. There was always mm. like the abolitionists. People don't understand that abolitionists, there are white people who died fighting to protect and to secure freedom for black Americans. This country has a rich history of white people fighting with black people. But the problem is we don't really talk about it in history books. It's not something that's really promoted, but this has happened. And we just have to get back to coming together and working together again. You can look at Bacon's mm -hmm. Rebellion when everybody came together, like they rioted for a year. There was a whole rebellion for over a year that it took them to quash. And if we would have won, the you know, it would have been a very different thing. So I think instead of, it's frustrating for me as, as an ADOS person, as a US Freedman, it's very frustrating for me because like I want reparations, but I have four white god sisters and they all pretty much have children except for one. Mm. I want their kids to have a wonderful life too. I want their kids to have access to good education because they live in the country. So, you mm. know, they're not city kids and they're not rich people either. So like, I want them to have access to healthcare. I want them to have good resources. I want them to, if they decide they want to go to college, be able to go to college. If they want to stay in their town and work in their town, I want them to be able to do that. So I just don't understand how I can want so much for for so many people. And it's just such a fight for people to want reparations for us. Even if you're not down for reparations, why don't you just say, okay, well, if you'll fight with us for this, we'll fight with you for that. And let's just call it a deal. And I, that's, that's such a good point to, to bring in. I, I mean, the problem with a lot of American politics, maybe not even politics, maybe just American cultures, every single thing is presented as a zero sum game. Yes. If you get something, I lose something. If I get something, you lose something when that's not necessarily it. So when you brought up how this is kind of all part of a package, but you put reparations first, that makes sense to me because I mean, anyone who's watching this, they're going to be leftist, socialist, communist, and they know. I mean, if I could make a list of all the things that we need to do yes. to fix this country, it would be long. So 
we need a gigantic package and we're kind of seeing this build back better plan 3.5 trillion and it's not it's it's nice to see not enough at all but it's I, it's nice can, to see we, a bunch of things to get without the racism can we bring back the new deal without the racism it would be <laughs> right. perfect it would be perfect. They had writers' projects. You and I could get some money to do this. People could get money mm -hmm. to to take care of their grannies. People get money to read to old people, write scripts, films, open juice bars, food trucks. Like, yeah, let's bring it back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and that's what that's kind of like something that we need on that scale where yeah. we there's so many issues you can't just address one thing or incrementally address lots of things. We need Medicare for all. We need climate change reform. Yes. We are not reform, but action. Um, yes. We need the reparations. Jobs guarantee so we can start rebuilding the infrastructure of the country because we're gonna have to move whole groups of people from one place to another in this country. Like we gotta stop fighting each other and start getting ready for what's coming. Right. And and I, I love the way that you put it. It's like, if you fight for me uh, with me on this, I'll fight with you on that. That's the thing that's missing in modern day politics. And I don't know if it's just the product of the era where there's social media and we're all kind of decompartmentalized. Mm -hmm. We're all in our own bubbles. And so we don't necessarily speak with each other anymore. But I think that solidarity is really lacking, especially with leftists. And really what we have to do is reconnect again as a movement. And it's tough because it's... In my opinion, having a movement flourish, it really does need leadership. Uh, but there has to be some point where all of these different groups come together. Mm -hmm. um, Eidos, uh, the Sunrise Movement, and and they kind of have this solidarity and mm -hmm. they flex their muscle because together, uh, I think that it actually is doable if there is enough noise and maintain pressure. And that's what I wanted to ask you about with Eidos because this is the first time that we've ever, or at least as, as long as I've been alive, um, noticed sustained talks of reparations. Sometimes it would come up in presidential campaigns. Uh, and a politician would signal support for it or they'd shoot it down. But it's only a conversation once every four years. This is the first time where the conversation is still going on. And part of that is, I think, the persistence. Part of that is saying, this is what I want first, period, end of story. And that level of relentlessness, I think, is truly a blueprint for getting things done, keeping it on the agenda. So talk through uh, the ADOS movement in general and why this is issue number one. Because I think that a lot of people with white privilege or who are non-Black, they can't understand it. But put it all in context yeah. for us. Well, I get what you're saying. So I know a lot of people are like, well, why can't you just do universal policies? So the best mm -hmm. way to explain it is we would be the bottom stable poor in your new socialist society because that's pretty right. much how it would work out because unless you're so listen this is my thing with the socialists i don't have a problem with socialists but some of y'all are democratic socialists and some of y'all are socialist socialists so you democratic socialists y'all are not talking about wealth redistribution so mm -hmm. until you're talking about really going up and really snatching some money from the top and shifting everybody's numbers I don't want to hear anything because that's the only thing that would actually change. It's just it's perfect example, right? If we live on the same block and they say, OK, we're giving everybody ten thousand dollars to fix their house. Right. If you already had ten thousand dollars in the bank, you have 20 grand to fix your house. If I had a dollar, I have ten thousand and one dollars. That may not be enough to fix what I need in my house. It, it's just really simple. It's it's we are so far behind and people don't even understand. I think. People in this country think black people are behind because like we're kind of lazy or we don't really have a good work ethic, but you can trace everything through. So after slavery, we got it together. Like we went off, we started, you know, we started building little towns. We started getting our stuff together. Next thing you know, boom, people come in, they're burning down the town. They're killing people. Like there are so many books that are written. There's this book called Buried in Bitter Waters where he just talks about racial cleansing where he literally was like, okay, first, so basically he only talks about where people over, like, I think over a thousand people got expelled or over a certain percentage of the black population was expelled. Because originally when he first started doing it, there was too many areas. He had to narrow the search so he could actually write a book. And I think he got it down to like 10 places. Uh, mm. So like Forsyth County, they expelled pretty much their whole black population off of some, some incident with a young white woman. And next thing you know, they're killing people in town and rushed and ran everybody out so that's so like okay that's a long time ago right well 
we literally were, uh, we literally had black codes into the 1960s, which means you couldn't necessarily, you couldn't buy your home certain places, you couldn't live certain places. There was an actual threat of danger because people could just lynch you. Like lynchings were going in on into the 50s, in the late, late 50s. So like if you got too successful, like there's people who literally would get successful and hide their success because they wouldn't want to draw attention to themselves because they wouldn't want people to think they were uppity. And then we just keep going. So then after that, you have the 70s, the 80s, you have all this redlining still. Like, and then we get a little bit of something. Like, you know, after the 60s, like they opened up a little bit. We, They're like, okay, we're going to give you guys access to jobs. We start getting a little bit of something. Next thing you know, deindustrialization. Like, and we're back here down. The, we never got a chance to build real well. I guess that's what I'm really trying to say. Like people, the black, we've never had a black middle class. We've always mm -hmm. only had a few token people who were able to make it out. But for the most part, most people are just down. And we, sorry, give me a second. It's just, it gets frustrating sometimes because yeah. it's so hard because like 50% of the homeless population in this country is black. Yeah. Like, and you have to understand after they released us from slavery, they released us to nothing. So people died of exposure, smallpox, like, where do you go? So here mm -hmm. we are now and our people are still homeless. Plus, the 80s, we have the crack epidemic where we know that they allowed, um, you know, the Iran Contras to pump drugs into our our inner cities. Like all of this affects everything that has happened to us then. So there are a few people who can work their way out of it, but that's the same way for white people. Like, yeah, you know, as a white person, you might be a Warren Buffett, maybe, but the odds of it are very, you know what I mean? So people just don't yeah. understand it's it's like it's a lot when you start looking at the numbers and you see the data you start to understand so it's not through faults of our own like we go to school mm -hmm. we get college degrees then we either don't get hired or when we do we make less money you know we yeah. we try to buy homes but the neighborhoods that we buy our homes in they don't appreciate in value the only way they appreciate in value is if white people move in and then our property taxes go up and we can't afford it and we end up having to give up our homes gentrification like mm -hmm. everything we try to do to we try to start a business but we can't get the same loans we can't get the same help like if you have people look up what's going on with the black farmers like you know the farm subsidies pretty much keep farmers alive and they're being denied for these loans. They can't get this. Like we can't get a leg up even when we try, even when you're at your best. And let's just say you are at your best, right? Let's say you succeed one mistake. One thing goes wrong. You lose everything. You're back down to the bottom with everybody else. I'm sorry. I know that got a little long winded. But. No, it's, <laughs> it's perfect. It's there's also this heightened vulnerability. It goes to the drug war where if you are a mm -hmm. successful black American, well, you may do drugs or, or smoke pot at the same rate as your white peers, but who's more likely statistically to get locked up? And it's not a coincidence. That's what I think people need to realize is that we have to broaden our horizon. Universal programs are great, but if everybody rises and you have white people here and black people here, they just all rise at the same time, but you still have people who are down. And part of the problem is that our entire system has been designed to disadvantage Black yeah. Americans. And that's not some unintended consequence. Our institutions are white supremacist institutions. And any policy that has been uh, uh, delegated to basically try to alleviate these issues, it's like playing whack-a-mole. You need systemic mm -hmm. reform because every single time there's been opportunities for uh, growth for black people, uh, there, there, there. it's like two steps forward, one steps back. And I'll, I'll give like my own personal example. So I used to commute um, when I lived uh, outside of Portland and uh, this road that I would drive on very, very uh, busy highway. I have never seen a cop a single time, not mm -hmm. once, not a single. So I would speed, mm -hmm. I would go fast, not even worry about it. And then I talked to my niece who's a Latina and her partner's black. And every time they drive that same road, mm. they get pulled over. Wow. Every time. And so to me, being someone who has never had to think through these things, not think about, you know, where I am, where the yeah. police might be, that really, I mean, it's not like I wasn't aware of this, but white privilege is a thing that you always have to constantly put in check because this is something that you can't turn off. Like you can't, you can't uh, not be black. This is part of your experience. Yeah. So I just imagine, like I kind of try to broaden that. If you are someone who's successful, you're making six figures, you, you own a house. Well, all that, 
can go away. You can lose your job if some racist cop pulls you over and you mm. get arrested for some bullshit reason. Yeah. So at every turn, even if you make it, you might not keep it. And that's that's the problem. And, and it goes this isn't just like a new phenomenon. It goes back to the history. I mean, this is one thing that I, I try to get across to people um, whenever reparations come up is that if you have an entire group of people who are slaves and you just let them go what i mean it's like we see this kind of now and why the recidivism rate is so high when you people get out of prison yeah. they have no families to go to, they have nowhere to go so if because you do that to an no family bonds i was watching yeah. some weird i watch random stuff so i was watching something in spanish <laughs> on netflix about this woman in port you know in uh, brazil who killed her husband but she gets to go home for a week a year and spend time with her family. Yes, they literally let what? prisoners go home for period. They get furloughs for period of time every year. Like, could you imagine if like not, well, I would like all non-drug, non-violent drug offenders to be let out. But could you imagine yeah. if like non-violent offenders were able to go home for a couple of months a year and if we weren't price gouging their people so they can't talk to them on the phone? Like we're breaking those Jeez. relationships. Those relationships could be maintained but we mm -hmm. make it so expensive that you can't even do that. And I want to go back to your rising tides lift all boat. So this is Mud's thing, right? So mm -hmm. black people don't have boats. We are jet mm -hmm. on the little wooden, uh, little wooden door with rows trying to climb up. And that is our dinghy boat. So we don't have dinghy boat. We literally have driftwood. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good, <laughs> that's a good analogy. Boat, we might fall off the driftwood and drown. Like, yeah. There's no guarantees we're going with it. Oh, and then the other part I want to put out there too is because I I I'm glad that white people are um are confronting their white privilege, but mm -hmm. I don't want pe white people to feel like this is a guilt thing because mm -hmm. if you learn the history of this country, they taught you to hate black people. There were consequences. So Queen Mother Audrey Moore. Okay, so I'm gonna go a quick little thing. So after. <laughs> Because I because because I'm a his, I love history. So after slavery, there was a woman named Callie House who was a former slave. She literally went around and started organizing formerly enslaved people to try to get slave pensions from the government. This is less than five years after slavery. She had organized over three hundred thousand people. At that time, at five years after, they're telling her slavery's over, get over it. We don't need to give you nothing. There was literally money. There was literally a big cotton stock where they had seized from the South. And they asked, like, do y'all still have that? Do you still have the money? They were like, yeah, we have the money. Then they uh, they tried to sue to get the money, like, oh, there's no money. So this reparations fight started a long time ago and it could have been paid a long time ago. So the people who were in her movement, they ended up going into the Garvey movement. And from Garvey, we had Queen, uh, we had Queen Mother Audrey Moore. And there's an old uh, recording of her talking about, you know, um, after slavery, things were starting to get a little bit better for Black folks. They were starting to get things together. A lot of Black folks and white folks were working together. And then there was the turn. That's when the Black Code started. So white people who would work with Black people, they would tar you. They would feather you. They would make it where you couldn't have employment. You would have to, or they would kill you. There were real consequences. So when you think about that for generation after generation, let's talk about redlining, right? Let's talk about that. Let's say you are a good white person who doesn't hate black people, right? But if you let black people move into your neighborhood in the 60s, your stock, your um, housing price plummets because of white flight scare, and you could end up with a home or end up living in a neighborhood that's going to have no resources. So are you... Were you a racist or were you a person who, so like they incentivize you to yeah. be anti-Black. It's, it's a setup, right? It, 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 if you really mm -hmm. think about it, it's a setup and all of us have to not like not catch, not fall into those traps, right? Yeah. But, but you have to understand that there was traps that were created to condition people to become this way. Mm hmm and that's why you have to know you have to read history. <laughs> I do so much Absolutely. history on the Reset Race podcast. Like we literally have watch parties where like we watch lectures, which I'm amazed because like a hundred people will like watch a lecture. And I'm just like, okay, good. We're nerds. I like this. <laughs> that that's incredible. No, to get a hundred people to actually get educational information information is really, really incredible. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. So I want to go back to your thing about white privilege. And one way that I heard it explained really well, which is because people don't with privilege, there's this like inherent assumption that, oh, I'm guilty. I'm not guilty. I, I never did that. My, my ancestors yeah. didn't. You know what I mean? Uh, but one way to kind of frame it is it's not necessarily um, anything but a disadvantage that you don't have. So, for example, I could be impoverished just as any black American can be. But when I apply, apply for a job, statistically, I'm not going to get rejected because I have an African-American sounding name, which studies have shown that is the case. Or if I'm a white woman in America, uh, I am unlikely to be viewed as unprofessional because of my hair choice. I mean, all throughout the country, there's been disadvantages in every single facet of society, and it takes a very long time to unravel them. And the way that I think about it is the, the first step to actually tr building true equality is to put people on society in equal footing. And that's why I think that reparations is so crucial, not just as a social policy, but also as um, a legal debt that's owed. Uh, yes. I brought up a long time ago when I was talking to Michael Graham about reparations, you know, my, my father, my family didn't have much uh, intergenerational wealth, but my dad's great uncle died. I don't know if my dad even met him. And between my dad and all of his siblings, they got split money for his property that was so that, mm -hmm. that was sold. And so they all got like five thousand dollars. And it was a really good demonstration of how generational wealth works. Work. Ooh, um, I'm so glad where, you got that. Uh, so so right. there was a, a was a Wall Street Journal article and they're talking about how a bunch of Americans have stockpiled trillions of dollars and they're about to give it away to their Gen Xers right. and millennial uh, 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 grandparents, you know, kids and grandkids, and they're talking about somewhere around two hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars. No, two hundred and twelve, mm -hmm. two hundred and twelve thousand dollars. That's going to be passed on to people. Reparations is two hundred and seventy-two thousand. So please don't fight me for my reparations when a lot of you are going to get the <laughs> same money that I need. I'm not coming yeah. for your. I'm not coming for your inheritance. So leave my money alone, unless unless you want to trade. Now, if you want to give up the inheritance, if everybody wants to start over every generation like Black people, we can have a conversation. But that sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. Well, and and you know, it goes more than just like um, that example. It, it goes, I think, deeper than showing how generational wealth transfers, but I think it kind of serves as a good basis for the legal argument because there was no question, like when my dad got that money, he got a phone call from one of his siblings who told him and he's like, oh, okay. It, it, he didn't have to fight for that. He didn't have to petition lawmakers for that. He just got it because it was a legal debt that was owed to him. And this is a way that I want people to conceptualize reparations. It's something that was promised but never paid. And it doesn't matter that time has passed. That doesn't mean that it's any less owed. In fact, if time passes, the more that time passes, the more that it should be paid. I mean, there's late fees for regular uh, citizens if they, exactly. they miss their rent payment. You know, if they miss their bills. So for that shouldn't necessarily be persuasive. I used to tax the life out <laughs> for those late fees. <laughs> I used to work at Blockbuster. You're welcome. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's so one thing that I was really hoping that you could put into perspective and we do have some charts here yes. is oh, I love my charts. I how love <laughs> I love that you're a nerd because this is I, I'm a visual learner. So to the have this is really cool. important. Yes. So basically, black wealth is disappearing. That's what we started this with. Mm -hmm. But the rate to which black wealth that exists, not that there's much, but that it exists is disappearing Yes. should be frightening to every single person. Um, so can you talk through this? I do have some figures. I'll bring this up just for context here. But this is something that I feel like should give people that extra sense of urgency for this issue if they didn't necessarily think that this should be a priority. Well, well this is good for people to see, right? Because some of our favorites on YouTube, they say that the black white, gal the black, white wealth gap is only like in the top 10% of... Um, of Americans. But if you look at this, you see at every rate, black people have less than white people, even when white people have very little. So if you look in like the first quintile, mm -hmm. you'll see like white, uh, white families have 950, but then black families will have negative 12,000. You go to the next one, 60, you know, almost 67,000, then black families will have less than 2000. And it's at every level, even when you get up to the top, black families that are in the top 
uh, quintiles will have like 324,000 and then a white family will have a million. So these people don't even live in the same neighborhoods or live together. So the thing about it is even though white people, white numbers, like we do need, we do need, we need programs to help with the disparity in white communities as well. But when you put them side by side, you guys have class. Black people really don't have class. The first three quintiles are under $25,000 in wealth. That's not class, that's poverty. Mm -hmm. And then after that, 85,000, that puts you that puts you still under the third quintile for white people again. So you're a little bit, so are doing well black folks wealth wise or somewhere like in the second quintile for white people or right above that. Like people really don't understand that like the best and the brightest of black people are struggling and their families mm -hmm. are struggling. And then another thing I like to point out is for you to be in the top 5% of black families, all you need is five, sorry, it's $350,000. I need people to understand wow. that because there is no way in life that you could reach the top 10% of white people by, or the top 5% of white people by having $300,000, like $350,000. So if you're a black person and you own a home in like Los Angeles or New York or one of those big markets, you were in the top 5% of black people, even if you were literally struggling to pay your taxes every year. Like that's wow. how bad what's going on in our community is. And again, it's not the failure of people not working hard. It's the system. The system has worked to literally take wealth away from many black people. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I wanted you to kind of touch on is uh, or kind of expand on is systemic racism. I feel like leftists know that it's a thing, but it's hard to visualize it if you haven't seen it. And one example that I use is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I mean, with this pandemic, um, it's not a coincidence that black and brown people have died more from COVID, contracted COVID more. This isn't some random, it's not like black people are going out and getting exposed to it more. It, we're all doing the same thing. But the reason why this is happening is because of the systems in place at every step of the way, black people are disadvantaged in this country. Uh, in ways that are not even conceivable to many people, uh, ways that we don't think about. And it, this is because it is embedded in our institutions. Mm -hmm. And you can't take that out easily. It has to be ripped out. Um, and it's a really difficult process. But I think that that really, like, you you can't, so when it comes to unemployment rates or anything, any other data point, it, you can you can try to come up with some bogus argument. Well, it's because, uh, you know, black people, they don't work as much because there's fathers in the homes. That's a, a racist trope that comes up. Uh, but when it comes to COVID-19, what's, this is a new thing that we all learned about a couple of years ago. How do you, how do you rationalize that if you're a right winger? Do you say, oh, well, you know, black people just like being exposed to, what's the, what's the excuse, right? <laughs> It's systemic racism. So, I mean, could you talk more about systemic racism? Because I feel like people don't necessarily, like, they understand it, but it's kind of amorphous. Can you give, like, a concrete I, example of this? I feel like the best way to describe it is, like, systemic racism. Let's talk about the school system, right? The, um, right. the school to prison pipeline, right? Right. So you shut, or you, there's so many things, but let's, let's start with the schools, right? So you start shutting down schools, or you don't put enough funding and resources into these schools, right? So you have schools that are under-resourced, underfunded, plus the communities are under-resourced and underfunded. So then when kids act up in school, because <clears throat> a lot of times, like, I, I didn't do a lot of acting up in school, but I was really smart and really bored. So mm. I, you know, but I saw other kids be punished for what other kids would do. But this is the thing with it. So you have kids and next thing you know, these kids are getting in trouble. Like you have uh, school resource offices, officers in there and they're, you know, locking up kids and taking kids to jail. And these kids are getting records in school and it starts to translate like what future does that child have? So you were in school, your school's underfunded. So you're not learning anything. They pass you along. And if you are smart and bright, you're still dodging your community. And if you're lucky enough to be smart enough to get out, you have to hope you were smart enough to get scholarships. You find a job where you got to go. Like there's so many facets to it. But for the kids who don't make it, you just pump them into the prison system and you warehouse them until they're in their 40s or 50s. And then you send them home to their families to take care of them for the rest of their lives because you're not going to give them opportunities. Like that's mm -hmm. one way that the system works. I remember I saw this really good TikTok video. I wish I could remember it where this gentleman went through and he showed like the levels of lynchings. And when the levels of lynchings go down, the prison system numbers go up. So they literally oh, wow. switched one thing with the next. Yeah, it's 
So that's a good way. I feel like that's a good way to describe it. And a lot of, there's just a lot of other things like just the way the communities are set up, right? If there isn't a good bus transportation or good public transportation to the nice white community with the jobs, how do I work? Because there's no jobs in my community. Like this is before we even talk about if a white person will hire me, there might be the best white person ever who's there who wants to hire black people. But if I can't have transportation to get there every day, they can't help me. Like, yeah. so this is, it's there, like I said, there's so many facets. Like there's, it's just a lot. It's a, it's a system. That's why I need white people to understand. It's a system. Like nobody's saying that every white person is racist, but you live mm -hmm. in America. So you might be a little racist. And I say mm -hmm. that as a black American who grew up in the suburbs, it makes you a little racist. Like I had to learn mm -hmm. some anti-black shit. Like, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I oh no, you learn, can curse. Like, you know, but I had to learn a little bit of anti blackness. Like, I had to learn when I walk into an elevator with a big black man not to be scared. Why am I scared? I'm with my people. But, <laughs> but I had to unlearn that just from growing up in the suburbs. Like, people don't understand. Wow. We, all watch, we all watch TV, the news mm -hmm. bombards. It's like visual, you don't understand the things that just shape the way you think without you even trying to. As I said, it's not about blaming you, it's just about start looking around. And if you don't know, like, just take some time to look up and read some stuff. Like, I went to private school times in the eighth grade. And then from then on, I went to public school. So I had a public school, high school education. Nothing that I know about Black history. And to be honest, nothing that I know about the majority of American history did I learn in school. I had to take time to educate myself on my own. So, like, don't be a, don't, don't feel upset or bad. Like, I have people like, oh, my God, I can't believe I didn't know this. I was like, I didn't know this till five years ago. Like, I just mm -hmm. read it in a book. Like, just people have to people if you want to know you just have to start making the steps and try and then you know yeah. try starting to talk to some black people that's another thing a lot of y'all don't talk to regular black people don't talk to rich black people Stop <laughs> talking to rich black if she grew up in the suburbs with you don't talk to her go talk to somebody else you need to talk to somebody who grew up in the inner city or talk talk to a poor black person like because once you do, you start to understand what's going on. But I think a lot of times, like, oh, I have a black friend. Well, your black friend's in the top 5% of black people. So yeah. you're talking to yeah. a rich Negro. I'm sorry, but, like, you're talking to the wrong person. Well, and my response to the black friend thing is, if, if it comes from a millennial, it's, you don't have a black friend. We don't have any friends. We're millennials. We don't talk to anyone anymore. So <laughs> don't lie. You're you're bullshitting me. So basically, you're, you've kind of given us just a little sneak peek of what you discuss on the Reset Race podcast. You have history lessons. You have really in-depth conversations. And basically, everything that I know, I know from Michael Graham, <laughs> I, at least the, the intricate details. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you tell people basically where they can find this podcast, yes. what it's about, what you do, and why they should watch it most importantly? Because I feel like people, if you're hearing about reparations at length for the first time, you yes. might not necessarily understand stand it you might have questions but that's okay it, yes. this is a learning process and that we we live for what 80 years if we're lucky as human beings you're not going to get all the knowledge in the world it's you're constantly learning and, and this is part of the process and reset race is an incredible resource and i love that you do media critique media analyses you take what is being said the discourse and you break it down i i think it's 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 invaluable so explain where people can watch this set and, and kind of let us know what what you talk about okay so you can join you can come find us at the reset race network because we have a lot of shows but our but our flagship show is the reset race show so that show is basically we go and we we go through a lot of the we, we i say like the leftists the leftist progressives a lot of their talking points because a lot of them have some good ideas but when it comes to black people and black issues they just fall off the cliff it's it's embarrassingly it's bad yeah. yeah so our whole thing is to kind of go through and critique so we can let people who are fans of them like for a lot of them some of them yeah we want you to go away but the majority mm -hmm. like we just want you to talk about us a little bit too so we're hoping mm -hmm. from people watching us they'll start encouraging the people they watch like hey you know you can talk about black issues too we're okay with that like mm -hmm. we, we like black people too I, it, that's all we're looking for. So we really break down the arguments. The reset ratio is a little raunchy. There's a lot of fussing and cussing. So definitely be be ready for it. But 
it's also like data and analysis. We mm -hmm. pull out everything. We'll pull out articles. We'll pull out charts. But we'll also pull out like clips from a movie. Like I, I pulled out the um, Weekend at Bernie's 2 clip talking about Joe Biden, how they dusted him off and resurrected him <laughs> to win. And I had weekend, I had Bernie doing the, <laughs> the Weekend at Bernie's thing for Weekend at Bernie's. I like that. I, don't, I, I feel like these days, like people are like, some people know what you're talking about. Some people don't. But just Google it. You'll see it. It's yeah. hilarious. <laughs> So we just try to keep it fun for everybody. And then we just launched a couple more shows. So, well, Bitter Dose has been with us from the beginning. So the Bitter Dose TV show has great analysis as well. And when you were talking about Reagan um, doing uh, doing reparations for the Japanese and the things that they were talking about, Mud did a whole Japanese internment campaign, uh, internment camp issue where for reparations. And they actually went through the hearings and everything else. Oh, it's so good. They literally use the same excuses now that they're giving that they gave the Japanese about why they shouldn't pay them reparations are the same excuses they're giving them now. Even down to white people won't like it and they might come for you and attack you again. It's, it's too it's divisive. Textbook. It's so Interesting. textbook. So we have bitter dose. Then we just started the John Brown leftist, and that is all accomplices and ADOS people. So we I think the total crew is like 14. But That's we incredible. average, we average around 10. <laughs> okay. It's great. Like we have like a good uh, coalition. Everybody is there who is for reparations, but we're also trying to work on ideas for like how to, what our goal with Reset Race, the network is to start translating all of this stuff offline. We want to actually mm. teach people how to organize, how to not only just not use our ideas, but how to come up with their own ideas as well. So yeah. we're, we really want to see this translate onto the ground. So that's what we're trying to do with that group because it's a nice coalition of people. So we're going with that. I'm excited. And then we just got another show that was added, which is called The Hero Hunter, which is by Cash. And he literally goes through and he um, he takes down uh, like the George Washington myth, the Thomas Jefferson myth. So that's something that's really, but he does it like in a fun, interesting way. So he has like anime clips in it and like different. That's clips. awesome. It's really good. It's really entertaining. And then we're going to have an interview show that's going to be starting around Thanksgiving. So that's everything that should be coming out or is out this year. So we have a lot going on at Reset Race. Like you should definitely check that's, us out. That's incredible. I didn't know you all had expanded that much. That's really incredible. <laughs> that we, we move kind of fast. So, <laughs> hey, well, I mean, it, best, but when you see a need, you kind of have. Damn it! Sorry, my dog. My mom's gonna have to go get my dog. I can hear. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I have dogs too, so I can totally understand. If you want to, if you want to bring the dogs on camera, that will score bonus points for the viewers for sure. <laughs> so this, is, this is my little. She's she's a German Shepherd slash. Oh. <laughs> she's beautiful. How yeah, old is she? She's uh she'll be three months in two days. So she's oh she's a puppy. Wow. Mm -hmm. She's a baby. Oh my god. Oh my well, here's one thing I'll recommend for reset race. If you do live streams, uh do a dog cam. So I started doing that on Twitch streams and the people show up for the dogs more than that's they show hilarious. up for me. Well, that's good to know. I'll just yes. have her have her sit there and uh, abuse everything. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> no well sam it, it's been so much fun bringing you on hopefully you can come back at another point in time um yeah i i, I, well, I love the recent us. i would love to i would love to and let me just say one thing uh, so people who are watching this they might tune in and see criticisms of their favorite media personalities but here's one thing that differentiates reset race from other uh, uh other podcasts it's good faith it's actually constructive and it's about learning not for clickbait, which is yeah. really, really important. People might see it in the like, oh, you're attacking this person. But it's not necessarily an attack. It's more of a correction. And I think that that's so important because wh when it comes to issues like this that oftentimes get co-opted, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, reparations with politicians, for example, gets co-opted in those, oh, I support reparations when you mm -hmm. press them on it. Do you? So it's important that you guys take the time to explain because I do think that that is crucial to the learning uh, to the learning process. But Sam, uh, is there anything else you want to say before we before we wrap? Your dog is so cute. No, thank you so much. I just want to thank you for having us. Everybody, come check out the Reset Race Network, and you know, bear with us. Like I said, we do beat up on your favorites a little bit, but we just want them to be better. Like the thing yeah. about it is. The only way you guys are going to win is if you get black people to join you. Like, you don't understand, like, black people, we don't have to fight against you. All we have to do is stay home. 
So like, mm -hmm. if you want to get people excited, like reparations is a way to get black Americans excited. You want Obama numbers for, for people you want, then yeah. you, you, we got to push them. And to be honest, we got to push them to do better for all of us because all of us yeah. are struggling. So, yeah. but yeah. if you fight with me, I'll fight with, I'll fight with, you know, if you fight with me for what we need, I will do the same. And like I said, I'm here for it. I, like people don't understand. Like we, we, we watch all of the content creators. Y'all mm. don't even understand like how many black people watch y'all and we'll start watching and something like, oh man, they don't like us. Oh. And mm -hmm. we'll just fall off and we'll never leave you a comment. We'll never say mm. anything about it. We just go away. And that's yeah. worse because you don't even know that you're losing people. So, yeah, you know, yeah, well, to... I... oh, here's one last thing. So one of the ladies on the on the uh, John Brown left that she said when uh, when reparations came up, when Bernie was running, that it caught her completely off guard and she didn't even realize that there had been a reparations conversation going on. So for me, hmm. yeah, but I understand because, you know, there's black Twitter, white Twitter. So she mm -hmm. just didn't fall into black Twitter. But I think going forward for these next elections, like there's going to have to be a, a mixing of what's going on because white yeah. people, when you hear black people are trying to fight for something, you can't just automatically dismiss us. It's very, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't make us feel good about trying to work with you. So mm -hmm. even if you're not, even if you don't like what somebody's saying, just give them a minute to talk it out, you know, have, ask some questions and ask them, you know, in a, and like, a, you know, well, okay, I'm just, and sometimes it's okay just to be like, look, I just want to ask a question to get some understanding. This is not an attack. Just, and people will give you the information, but you have to actually start talking to us instead of just dismissing us and be like, oh, you're just a bot or, oh, you're just a neoliberal. Oh, you just, you oh, just, li listen, I hate Joe Biden. Joe, my, my, my <laughs> uncle literally, this is the longest he's ever been out of prison since he was 18 years old. He is 50, he's like 56 wow. years old. He was a nonviolent drug offender. He was just a drug addict. He was been in and out of prison his entire life. And Joe Biden's son is the same, has those same kind of issues and he had a life. So mm -hmm. I hate Joe Biden. So when people are like, oh, you're just neoliberal and you're just for the Democrats. And no, I'm for my people. I would like to see yeah. my people do better. And to be honest, I'd like to see the whole country do better because you know I don't want the hunger games. Nobody Thank you. Bad Max. <laughs> that doesn't and, sound and, good. and for those of y'all who watch The Walking Dead, black people don't do well in this stuff. <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> yeah, y'all got too many guns and resources. Y'all are already ready for the end of the world. Like we a little behind on that. So I'm gonna need us to come together now. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and let me just say that as a gay dude, I'm not an alpha male, so I would I would be one of the first to die in that scenario as well. <laughs> Man, you better find you a friend. <laughs> you better find you a friend. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I am here with Isaiah James running in New York's 9th Congressional District. He's running again. He's been on my show multiple times, and he is one of the best congressional candidates. Isaiah James, welcome back. Thank you so much for having me. So I, I, I've got to ask the question, and we've talked since you've launched again what on earth made you want to run for Congress a second time? Because the first time it sucks the life out of you. And every congressional candidate that I've spoken with says it is the most grueling, the most tiring thing that they've ever done. You're doing it twice in a row. What made you want to do it? Uh, well, first of all, this is not the most grueling or tiring thing I've ever done. Uh, I've been to war three times. That's, true. That's a good point. Regions, you know what I mean? So... This is actually pretty easy compared to getting shot at and blown up every Fair day. Enough. You know what I mean? So not that not that grueling. It's very time consuming. But what made me want to do it again, you know, I don't want to say do it again like it's just like some endeavor. What made me have to do it again is because the situation that we're in in this country is getting worse by the day. It's getting worse by the billionaire created. It's getting worse by the company that fires somebody you know, lays them off instead of wants to pay them a living wage. Nothing is getting better. Everything is getting worse. And it's not hyperbole for me to say that things are getting worse. People know that. So mm -hmm. nobody's stepping up. You know, the few people that do step up, their voices are drowned out. So, you know, what do we have to lose by, sit by, by standing up and fighting for our community? If I was to say, you know what, screw it, and sit back, the corporations aren't going to stop. The billionaires aren't going to stop. The millionaires aren't going to stop. Police violence is not going to stop. Housing injustice is not going to stop. Climate injustice is not going to stop. So I might as well have some skin in the game and try to fight for the things that I believe in and things that I know 
that'll make my life and my community's life better. And in turn, every working person and poor person's life better. So you better get you better, you better get off off your ass and get to it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, fair enough. Uh, so I've got to ask you, because you're running a second time and everyone who I've spoken with who has run multiple campaigns, they always say round two is it's different because you have a lot more inside insight. You know, the district even better, you know, kind of what you were lacking last time. What's different this time to you? I, I feel like now you kind of have the additional insight that you, that you need to actually win and bring it home. What do you think has been the biggest thing that you've changed with this second run? Uh, it's not really, I haven't changed anything. My message is still the same. It's, it's still, you know, a economic message for the people. But the thing is, I, I'm not as gullible as I was last time. I'm mm. not as, you know, rose-colored glasses as last time. You know, last time, believe it or not, I was running. I was like, I didn't want to tell anybody I was running. I thought I could do it in secret and, like, you know, sneak up and be the insurgent that nobody saw. I didn't really want to raise money because I don't like asking poor people and working people for money. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't really need money. I just need a good message and a good voice and some, mm -hmm. and some you know, good volunteers. I'm not as naive as that this time. So I know, I just, I grew up a lot from 32 year old Isaiah to I'll be 35 uh, in two weeks. So I grew up a lot. Happy since birthday. Then. Thank you. October 13th, I turned 35. I can't believe Okay. That. So yeah, I grew up a lot since then. You know what I mean? And it just, it just shows me that it shows me that this fight is worth having because when I was young and, and idealistic at 32 thinking I could change the world. Now I'm at 35 and I know that we have to change this world. Yeah. And I turned 35 next year and I feel like with each passing year, I get more and more cynical, but not necessarily in a bad way. I, I mean, some of it is doomerism, but I feel like I just know more. I know what to expect I know how to view the world better. And I, I feel like with age, it really does come wisdom. Not for everyone, because oftentimes the trope is that when you get older, you get more conservative. But that certainly hasn't been the case with me, and I don't think it's the case with you. Uh, so it's interesting. One thing that I wanted to ask you about is, and we talked about this the last time you were running for Congress, is you are running against Yvette Clark. This is the incumbent. And we don't hear very often about Yvette Clark. You know, the rotating villain for the Democratic Party, if you will, is Mansion Cinema. And, and so she's definitely not as bad as someone like Henry, Henry Cuellar or other corporate Democrats. So why do you feel as if she needs to be primaried? I want to correct you on something. She is just as bad as all of them. She's just quiet. Mm. She doesn't do anything. Uh -huh. She doesn't make any waves. She just takes the corporate money and doesn't do a goddamn thing. So they're mm. just as bad. Let's not equivocate on okay. her taking pharma money. Let's not equivocate on her taking defense money and big gas and big sugar and big agra and big insurance. That We're not going to equivocate on that. She's just as bad as the rest of them. She just doesn't do anything. That's why you never hear about it. At least Joe, mm. Joe Manson's a piece. Of, he's a POS, but he takes a stance. You yeah. Clark, she's, she's, she's a tissue in the wind. She goes wherever the wind blows. She doesn't want to ruffle feathers. She she votes for anything military. She votes for anything, you know, Nancy Pelosi said. And as we can see, look what's happening in Congress right now. Even the Demo some of the Democrats don't want to, you know, bolster the social safety net. So all of these folks, they're just as bad. What makes me know that she needs to go is that, dude, if you walk around my district right now, all right, as the same homeless people who are on the streets that were on the streets three years ago if they didn't die from the pandemic. If you walk around my district right now, there's more drugs, there's more crime, excuse me, there's more children who are hungry, there's, there's, there's more people getting evicted from their homes. I'm like, what the hell is going on? If in two years during a pandemic, you had a, the world at your feet, you could have done anything, you could have put forth any bill and got people rallying to your side and you did nothing. You did yeah. nothing. I mean, dude, the, we can't afford to have feckless, milk toast, middle of the road, Whatever acronym or adjective you want to use, we need bold transformational leadership, and we need it now. Look at the look at the world as it stands. You know, what I mean, the ice caps are melting, the Amazon's on fire. Do people are there's a goddamn pandemic that is killing millions of people, and we still have half the country who doesn't believe it's real. The other half of the country who just wants to go and bury their heads in the sand because they've been dealing with it like the rest of us. Now is not the time for us to take our eye off the proverbial prize, which is a more equitable and more just and a more more egalitarian society. 
and we can make it so. We just have to have people in office who want to make it so. Yeah, and I think that the point you're getting at is that if you're complicit, you're part of the problem. And I totally agree with that. She's not putting herself out there. She's not being a leader. And I think it's actually bad if a politician isn't trying to strive to have uh, more say, more national name recognition. You don't have to just put yourself out there because you have broader political ambitions and you want, want to run for president. You can put yourself out there because you have something to say. And that's really what I think is lacking. And it's the lack of effort from a lot of these lawmakers that is sufficient to warrant a primary challenge. But, you know, you are someone who's a leader. And, and so here's what I want to ask you. I actually want to pose a hypothetical question to you, because if you're in Congress, it's it's going to be challenging. It's going to be tough. I, I have no doubt that you can weather any storms, whatever they throw at you. But I'm curious as to what you would do in kind of peculiar, peculiar situations where there's really no right or wrong answer. So let's say that you just introduced some bill that you really want passed. This is kind of like your go-to issue. Um, and in order to get support for it, in order to get more co-sponsors for it, you have a group of Democratic Party lawmakers who say, we're not going to give you a committee hearing for this unless you vote for this other bill, which you don't actually agree with. Ideologically, you're opposed to it. So the question is, in that type of a scenario, which is bound to come up if you're in Congress, how do you balance out the pros and the cons, doing something you don't like to possibly benefit the greater good? How do you navigate those types of situations? Can you just kind of speak through your thought process? Yes. So I'm glad you brought that up. Somebody has to take a stand. If you keep equivocating, then it, you're bringing up a scenario that's not a hypothetical, dude. It happens all the time. It happens. And that's how we get yeah. all these pork barrel defense spending. Why do you right. think the rich keep getting richer and tax breaks keep going through? Because that happens all the time. Look what happens when there's a group of people who say, we're not going to vote for that bill unless you make the social safety net bigger. It's it's national news. They're like, what is going on? Because finally somebody's taking a stand. No, if it's going against what I believe ideologically, I'm not going to vote for it. I'm sorry. I'm not. Well, I told you this a year and a half ago. The lesser mm -hmm. of two evils is still evil. All right. Mm -hmm. I do not want to prescribe to that. I don't want to sign my name onto a bill that's going to give Israel more Iron Dome funding while our schools are failing. I am not mm -hmm. going to sign on a bill that gives a corporation a tax break while a single mother is struggling just to make ends meet and can't get help from the damn government. I cannot in good conscience do that. I would hope that the people of my district would vote for me knowing who I am and where I stand on the issues, sending me to Congress to represent their best interests and to do what I think is right on their behalf. Because I'm not some rich kid who just wants to run for office. I am one of you. When I take this suit jacket off, I walk down Flatbush Avenue, I go to the bodega, and I buy a sandwich because I am one of you. So I would want you to do what's in the best interest of me, and I hope they understand that anything I would do would be in the best interest of them, not the rich and not the powerful. Yeah, I really like that uh, that answer because it kind of gives people a sense of what you're going to do in Congress. You're going to be one of the legislators Who's this immovable object? You and have to be. listen, you yeah, you have to be that immovable object because if you capitulate here and then there and then there and then there and then there, listen, a ship does not sink because all of the water around it. A ship only sinks when the water gets inside of it. So if mm -hmm. you capitulate and a little crack here, a little crack there, and there's just a little bit of corporate money gets in here. A little bit of corporate money comes to your coffers there. And then you're invited to a, a cigar tasting here and a, and a whiskey sipping there. And then you become corrupted just like all the rest of them. So yeah, and I think, I think the issue is that if you make many compromises here and there, I think that sometimes that's acceptable. But over time, if enough lawmakers do it enough – I mean, we we get into the situation where you can't really break that cycle. And so I think it's really important to have people like you that kind of get in there and you're wrecking balls. You won't necessarily play by their rules and you don't want to be part of the establishment or their club. You don't want to make friends with your colleagues. You just want to get things done. I'm, I'm um, not going there to have to make friends. I'm going there to solve problems. I don't want to be any of those people's friends. I don't want to go to your parties. I don't invite me to food. Listen, if you know me, if I'm not working, I'm at home, I'm reading a book, I'm watching YouTube. I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to hang out with you. I'm your coworker, and that's where at, at 1700, 5 o'clock, when we walk out of this building, that's where that stops. Yeah. 
Okay, so I want to I want to ask you a different hypothetical question. Um, so it's about policy details, and you're one of the few people who I think really explain the fundamentals of certain policies that you support really well, like the intricacies. And sometimes we can get presented a package that is seemingly good, but when you dive into the details, it doesn't look so good. So for example, there's a, a couple of variations of paid family leave going through Congress. I don't know which one will ultimately land in the Build Back Better Act, the uh, reconciliation bill, but uh, Kirsten Gillibrand surprisingly has a really good um, paid family leave plan. It just takes from Social Security and people just, they they get that federally. But then there's also a corporate version of that same plan where it, it's uh, privatized and you go through a certain company, sort of like insurance. I don't know which one will ultimately land, but let's say that that was taken out of the bill, that was decoupled, and there was a vote for paid family leave. All of a sudden, you have these independent media progressive personalities saying, Isaiah James just voted against paid family leave. He's a sellout. How do you handle that situation? Because it's really difficult. Like we're in, and, and this isn't, I used to think that this was just a mainstream media problem. It's also an indie media problem too, where sometimes we have standards that are either too high or we don't understand things. So how do you change the narrative as a politician when you're not necessarily able to come on shows as frequently as usual and explain yourself. How do you how do you handle that type of situation? Because optics is everything in politics. And once you kind of lose support, if you were to lose support, um, how, how would you try to regain trust among not necessarily your constituents, but people who uh, have been following you for years? My viewers, for example, people on Twitter. How would you respond to that? Because I genuinely don't have an answer, but I want to know what you think. Well, the thing about me is, you know, I'm I'm an accessible person. So I would like, you know what? I would hold Christian Cinema or Chris uh, or Chuck Schumer or they're not mm -hmm. gonna hold a live on on Instagram or Facebook. Our generation, we are the millennials, so I know how to use all yeah. this stuff. So yeah. one, don't don't look what I I say. Look what I do. Have, have I ever voted for anything? that, you know, goes against the interests of working people and poor people. No, I would never do that. I would so never, ever do that. So if I've ever done that, then you call me on that, but it will never happen. And two, I'll address the people. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a man of the people. If you have a problem with the way you think things are going and I'm your representative, you could talk to me. Send me a DM. I, there's right now, even right now to this day, Mike, and you know this, I have mm -hmm. thousands of followers on all my social media. I have the blue check marks. I have all that stuff. There's not a single person that writes my tweets, that does any of that stuff. Whoever does that is me. I see everything. I respond to everything. Because I, if something is going out in the world, I said it and I meant it. So just reach out to me and talk to me. You'd be surprised. Somebody wrote me an email to the campaign email the other day. They said, hey, Mr. James, I saw you on a show. I wanted to make a donation. Here's my phone number. I was like, okay. I called them. It wasn't a big donation. It was like 27 bucks. They were shocked that I actually called them. I was like, you told me to call you, so I'm calling you. I can devote five minutes out of my day to call you and to tell you what my platform and policies is about. It's just being accessible to the people. People get mad at, at AOC, but she doesn't, she gives you like once in a once a month, she'll cook something on live and answer a few questions. A representative is literally the voice of the people. So you just have to talk to people. You have to make people see that. I'm not voting against, I'm not voting for anything that's against your best interest. Because right now, people get so mad because they don't understand anything in Washington. It's all a bunch of, yeah. you, have you ever read, like people, you say I break down policies. I went to school, both undergrad and graduate, for public policy and, and political science. So I understand the minutia. It's about mm -hmm. breaking down these complex subjects into simple, easy to understand things for everyday people. Like, this is why this bill sucks. It sucks because it's going to give corporations, you know, huge tax breaks, and it's going to hurt you, the working person. And if they understand that you're, that you not only can tell them that, but that you're fighting for their interest because you're one of them, then people would believe you. That's why I, if you look last cycle, you remember all the policies that were going out, all my opponents were attacking each other. None of them said a word to me. None mm -hmm. of them said a word about me or to me, to my stuff. All they said was I had lack of experience, but they couldn't attack my policies because every one of my policies is written by working people. My wife is a teacher. That's why we talk about 
education. My wife is Puerto Rican. Her family is Puerto Rican. That's why we talk about independence for Puerto Rico. My father is an immigrant to this day. He's not a citizen. That's why immigration means a lot to me. I talk about veterans issues because I'm a veteran. I talk about student loan because I have student loans. LGBTQ means something to me because my little sister deserves the same equality as everybody else. So these aren't just amorphous topics to me. All of this stuff actually means something to me and means something to millions of people across this country. And that's what I'm going to fight for. Yeah, yeah. And, and I love it. And the reason why I'm bringing up these hypotheticals is because by now I feel like most of my audience knows you. So I think it's interesting to get the insight to what it would really be like to, to visualize what Isaiah James in Congress. I want to do, do a live with you so people can just ask questions right then and there you know what i mean that'd I be want, awesome i don't want people because i know we say like these questions aren't scripted but people i know somebody's out there gonna be like they probably rehearsed these questions which we did <laughs> yeah. which we, we did didn't know i promise you we did not but yeah live like even like a 30 minute live on twitter or something where people can just ask questions just yeah. ask me whatever you want to ask me as i guess i'm a public figure now i i had to google myself the other day and it said public figure which i never thought i'd be but whatever <laughs> just ask me whatever you want to ask me i'm just same regular old isaiah i told cool. my most of you don't know this i have on a nice blazer and a jacket <laughs> i have on sweatpants and crocs i'm not playing with you people might think i'm joking <laughs> my crocs right here dude i'm a regular everyday guy so don't don't let the glasses in the in the nice suit fool you I love it. Oh, I will say rule number one, when you become a public figure is never Google yourself. I learned the hard way that that is a very bad idea. So Yeah, I Googled myself. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I yeah. About me, you're like, I was 40 years old. I was like, I'm 40. I didn't know I was 40. Okay. I didn't yeah, know. yeah. So, I yeah. found very, very weird stuff. I actually broke down one of the uh, celebrity biographies written about me, and it was very strange to, yeah, to I, read. I, I don't know thing. where these people get this information some of the stuff they wrote, I'm like, that is absolutely not true. <laughs> yeah. I've never lived in Massachusetts. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but okay. Yeah, I yeah. It, it, in Massachusetts, I was 40 years old. I was like, wow, I didn't know any of this stuff. It's news to me. So yeah, n- news to you as the person who's reading this about you. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Wow, okay. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. Well, Isaiah, let people know how they can support you, what you need specifically. Uh, currently, is it donations? Is it canvassers? And just kind of like uh, give us your your last pitch. I, I feel like you don't have to win many people over on this channel. But if, if you're a newcomer here, what's your message to them? My last my last pitch to you would be. I, I'll tell to, we're millennials, so I'll tell it to the, the Gen Zers. We're in the end game now. All right. We, we, this is I've seen 14 million different scenarios. One of them we win. And the one we win is by electing pro, like actual progressives and people who are Democratic socialists and people who don't take corporate money to Congress. Every other scenario, every single one results in a, a, a failed America, results in the rich getting richer, black people getting treated like crap, immigrants, women, LGBTQ, everybody getting treated like crap if you're not a rich white man. There is one scenario in which we win, and that's by putting people in office who actually give a damn about you and me because they are you and me. So that'd be my pitch. My pitch would be, listen, you're broke. I'm broke. Everybody's broke. If you're not rich, you're broke. There's no there's no middle class in in America anymore. You're either rich or you're broke. I get that. If you can donate twenty seven dollars, fifty dollars, one hundred dollars, by all means, I would love for you to do that because every single dollar is. Uh, a, a door knocker we can hang on somebody's door. It's a, a T-shirt we can print up for a volunteer. It's 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 the staff that we can turn from volunteers into paid staff. You know what I mean? Because we want to pay people for their work. So yeah. those, those dollars actually matter and they actually count and they actually do do a lot to, for a grassroots campaign. And if you can't, follow me on social media and share whatever the hell I say. Blast it out. If you agree with it, blast it out to your... Your circle, your your circle, and your social circle, because six degrees of separation, you'll never believe who sees that. I'm telling you right now. I've said some stuff on Twitter, and I've had people hit me up. I'm like, how the hell did this person, who's a famous actress or actor, see this? Because somebody somewhere shared it, and they got to them, and we made that connection. And that's what it's about. It's about making the connections. Because I promise you, your problems aren't your just your problems. The things you're going through. It may feel like they're just yours, but other people are going through them too. And we only win by becoming the collective. You know what I mean? Just think about it. I always said this to you, I think it was two years ago, Mike. A single snowflake, it falls and it hits the ground and it melts. Has absolutely no effect. 
if enough snowflakes get together when they fall, they can create a mighty avalanche. They can wipe away anything in their goddamn path. So that's what the collectivism, collectivism is. Just think of it like that. So that's my pitch. You know, you can follow me, uh, Isaiah for Congress, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And then you go to IsaiahForCongress.com if you want to sign up to volunteer, get our newsletter, you know, buy some merchandise, which is coming soon, like shirts and totes and stuff that, that counts as a donation. And, you know, read my platform. That's it. All right. Well, Isaiah James, it's always a pleasure. I'm sure that you'll be back at some point in time before the primary. Uh, good luck. We'll be following your campaign. Thank you so much for having me. Now I'm about to go eat dinner because I am starving. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. All right. You take care. All right, man. Well, that's all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If you've made it this far in the program, thank you so much to the people who uh, tuned in and made it this far in the show. I really appreciate your patronage and your viewership. It means so much to me. And a special thank you to all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube uh, subscribers who help us not just to survive, but thrive as well. I can never thank you all enough. So that's all that I've got for you. Uh, look forward to weekly interviews. Uh, from candidates running in 2022, as well as weekly live streams on Twitch. Once again, I took a break, but I am now officially back, and I'm really stoked about that. So I'll see you all next week. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Take care, everyone.